morning. This open meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak in order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes. It is helpful that for our participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All the meeting materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. And we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We now turn to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that generates accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy, with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain agenda items. After members have spoken, I as the chair will afford public comment opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of the public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comment. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be taken by roll call votes. All right. So that brings us to our consent agenda. First on the consent agenda, we have meeting minutes of meetings, June 29th, 2020 and July 7th, 2020. We have for approval Arlington Community Card Lawn Signs through September 1st, 2020. CC Wendell, co-chair Thompson School PTO. We have a request for a contracted drain layer license from Asphalt Services, 210 New Boston Street, Street Woburn, and a request for a contractor drain, rail, drain layers license from Roots and Shoots, 86 Boston Road in Chelmsford. And I'll first look to Ms. Mahan for a motion. Move approval. And Mr. DeCourcy? Second. Um, Mr. Diggins, any comments? Sorry about that, no comments. And Mr. Curl, any comments? None, thank you. All right, so we have a motion by Ms. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy, Attorney Heim. Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. 
That brings us to appointments. Item number six on our agenda. An appointment to the Grants Committee of the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, formerly the Arlington Cultural Council. Andrew Conway, term to expire 6-30-2023. And do we have Mr. Conway with us? Oh. Hello, everyone. Hi, Mr. Conway. Thank you for yeah. your willingness to serve. If you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to apply for the position. Sure. Uh, let's see. I moved to Arlington uh, from London about 14 years ago. I have um, two daughters in Arlington Public Schools. Um, they will one will be a junior this coming year, and the other one will be a freshman. Uh, they've both been very involved in the uh, performing arts in Arlington and elsewhere um, since they were very small. Uh, I myself am a trombone player. Um, I've done some professional gigs around town. I, I've uh, uh, played at Town Day um, and various other places and uh, local community theater as well. Um, my, uh, my musical interests have uh, led to a lot of involvement in um, uh, the nonprofit uh, community theater and community music scene in other neighboring towns, uh, specifically Chelmsford and um, Sudbury. I was the president of the Chelmsford Community Band for several years. Um, and in that capacity, I, uh, uh, I essentially oversaw the, uh, the operational aspects of the band and, um, and uh, recruited, the, uh, uh, recruited the music director and participated in the artistic direction as well. Uh, I'm currently a trustee of the uh, the Sudbury Saviards, which is a uh, a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, group that's been around for um, uh, almost 60 years now. We're celebrating our 60th next year, and um, uh, interestingly, the um, there are more Arlingtonians in that group, um, both on the uh, uh, on stage and uh, in the orchestra and in the, uh, and in tech. There are more Arlingtonians than there are Sudbury people. So, um, so we're, we're very proud of that. And so um, essentially, I've been involved um, uh, in musical uh, uh, performing arts groups for years and years, but not so much here in Arlington. And uh, when I heard about the opportunity to participate on this board, um, I thought it would be a terrific uh, chance for me to get more involved and promote the, um, uh, you know, the arts community here in Arlington. Great. Thank you. I will turn to Mr. Carlos for any comments, questions, or motions. No, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for your uh, willingness to serve. Um, as I noted, the, the last um, appointee uh, to this, this uh, body, you know, uh, this grants committee, uh, formerly the uh, Arlington Cultural Council, is very important that the state funding that comes through every year is, is quite modest, but I'm always blown away with... Um, the, the talent of the committee and, and leveraging that for very interesting projects. And we're going to need uh, the arts more than ever, I think, as we someday start to emerge from um, the pandemic, uh, particularly. So really appreciate you stepping up and, and um, you know, offering your talents. And I'd like to move approval of the uh, appointment. Thank you. And Mr. Diggins, any a second? Questions or comments? I wholeheartedly second, you know, but I, I, I do have a, a couple of questions. You know, I, I read through the resume, very impressive. You know, uh, even although you're in the PM, um, you do a lot of project management and, uh, and from a technology realm, I could imagine putting forth these uh, similar resume myself. So I'm kind of wondering about the grant writing um, or grant aspect of this gig, you mean, and, and, and the, the background that you have in that? Sure. Um, so, as um, uh, as a trustee of the um, of both of the groups that I've participated in for years, um, I've been uh, part of the. I've written grants and applied for grants uh, in uh, in a lot of the uh, neighboring towns, and um, and I've done a couple of workshops in um, in grant writing. And I'm you know that's a that's a skill that I'm still developing, but um, I uh, you know I do a I. I approached the whole, uh, you know, grant funding uh, process like I would, uh, I think, like I would, uh, you know, any anything that I encounter in the business world. You know, as long as you're, you, know, you have to be very clear about what the expectations are. You need to have uh, clear criteria, uh, and then, 
uh, one of the things that I really, what I really like about this role is that once the grant has, uh, once the funding has been approved, um, you know, the, uh, the people on, in the committee actually work side by side with the artists to ensure that they're, you know, making use of the, uh, the grant money effectively, but also to nurture them and, uh, and to uh, help them grow in the, uh, you know, in, in the community so that they're not just artists in their own right, they're artists within the Arlington community. Well, thanks for explaining that second part uh, of the job. I wasn't aware of that, and, and that's, that, that's actually very important. So thank you very much, and, and uh, welcome aboard. Thank you. Yeah. And Ms. Mahan? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to thank Mr. Conway, Andrew. Um, I'm definitely cognizant in reading everything of the vast grant writing experience, as well as being a musician. And in the theater, so you also know, um, the best way to uh, form the grant as well as the few grants that you can get through the state but um, I know you're much more well versed in terms of different organizations that are sort of expanding um, their grant opportunities you know like the foundation Cummings organization mm -hmm. that's something you're on top of and I do really appreciate that because that's unfortunately um, we always need grants um, currently for, for the arts and theater, but now with COVID-19, it's really kind of tripled that effect. So you got a lot of yeah. work ahead of you, sir. Hope so. And Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I'd just like to thank Mr. Conway as well for your willingness to serve and for your uh, volunteerism in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conway. I'd just like to second what I've heard from my colleagues. Just thank you for your willingness to step up and serve on this really important committee. All right, so we have a motion for approval by Mr. Caro, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Hyde? Ms. Mahon? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Caro? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Thank you very much. All right, so that brings us to item number seven on the agenda, discussion and vote. Black Lives Matter banner. So I will open this up. I'll turn to the town manager just to give us a brief introduction, then we'll take over. Uh, thank you, Chair Hurd. Uh, very, very briefly, I'll say um, when, when, when we put the banner up just about a month ago or a little over a month ago, uh, I don't think there was any intention or feeling that, uh, you know, that, that it was something we wanted to take down, but proclamation uh, or the resolution, excuse me, as was drafted and approved by the board to talk about taking the banner down after the acknowledgement and celebration of Black Lives Matter a uh, day a week ago today. Uh, it's become clear, uh, at least to me in the community, that um, in terms of acknowledging this value of, of Black Lives Matter, uh, that you know, continuing to acknowledge it in the community is of importance. So my suggestion for the board is that we keep the banner up uh, for a period of time until I can come back after working with the Human Rights Commission, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator, and other community stakeholders, and recommend how we will properly acknowledge that value in the community. But until we come back with that plan, uh, keep it on town hall, um, again, un until a new plan has been brought forth. Thank you. And this is certainly an issue that has been prevalent for all of us in the past week or so um, since the 13th came up. That was the original date in the proclamation. And we are still doing lots of work. It's still very much in the minds of Arlington residents. And, you know, we've gotten input on both sides of the issue on whether or not to leave it up and keep it up, keep it down. But I have spoken to the town manager and what I would propose based on what the manager is recommending is to give, like you said, him some time to talk to the, you know, the necessary parties, the Human Rights Commission and all, everyone that needs to comment on this and come back with a permanent plan for the banner, which I, you know, our August meeting is coming up in just a couple of weeks. And I think we'll need a little, it will be the will of the town to have it up a little longer than that. But, you know, my plan would be to shoot to have 
some sort of further discussion on this in our September meeting. So with that, I'll turn to the board for discussion as to any motions or comments or thoughts as to how we proceed here. So Mr. Carl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously we've, we've heard a lot of passions around this um, and, and it's understandable. I mean, this, this we raised the banner in the way we know, we raised the banner in the wake of a, a horrific murder of um, George Floyd and, uh, and recognition similar incidents like like that um, we come together tonight um, I don't think any of us could have imagined that we'd be coming to get, together um, in the wake of uh, losing two titans of the civil rights movement um, Reverend Vivian and and and, um, and Congressman Lewis both of whom are freedom riders and, and um, associates of Dr. King and and, um, and uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom winners so I think the, the values that are expressed in those three words, Black Lives Matter, I think they, they do reflect a value that we, we banner or no banner, it's, it's incumbent upon us to, to um, continue living that, um, those, those values. We, we've heard from a lot of members of the community. Overwhelmingly, the correspondence I've received would like to see that, that statement there you know, for the foreseeable um, uh, future and um, we've heard others who have been concerned either with the, um, any types of messages on town hall or or um, <clears throat> conflating that statement of principle with organizations by the same name or specific policies or whatnot but I, I think that especially during this season of um, really distress for the, for the country it, it makes a lot of sense for us to to um, to continue for the foreseeable future, wait for 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 a further plan. Thankfully, I mean, one of the things that we always face ourselves as a board whenever we're looking at um, the use of public property. I mean, as a board, our specific jurisdiction, I think, most analogous is um, the uh, the um, light poles up and down Mass Ave. Um, and we, we have in the past, we, we frequently give, give permission either for Black History Month, we gave permission for the hanging of some beautiful banners, which stayed there long beyond that um, recognition. Um, but there are other groups in town that, that, um, that, that do seek use of the space. Uh, we typically would have had some contention for Town Day, um, as we know, Town Day is canceled. So we have some time, I think, to um, consider not, not just how do we live without the the, um, the the principles? Black Lives Matter. It's not a binary choice either. You know, we've heard from some people who have said, "Well, all lives matter." Nobody's disputing that. Folks are just recognizing that that our um, black brothers and sisters have not <clears throat> always enjoyed the full fruits of, of their uh, citizenship. That's what that. That's what to me that that means. Um, so. I'm, I'm happy to move that the banner stay um, in place, uh, to, to endorse uh, that the banner stay uh, in place for the foreseeable future and that the board consider a future plan for um, enshrining those values um, with, I would say, with a recommendation of the town manager that a policy also be developed for how, how the space is, is allocated as well. Okay, thank you. Mr. Diggins? I will second it. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak me, um, with respect to my principles and then with respect to um, uh, what I think is the pragmatic thing to do. Uh, the one, one thing about being in this position is that you recognize that you have to be cognizant and sensitive to and, and everyone's con everyone in the town and, and, and their concerns. Uh, and so um, we, I talk with people and my understanding about how uh, that space is, the use of that space has changed. I mean, it used to be that it, it only had announcements for uh, things like town day 
uh, and then it became a place for making people aware of various months like autism months and, and, and breast cancer. Um, and, and then at one point it, it I think, uh, hosted the, the pride banner or the pride flag. And, and I think from, from that point on, it, it became a, a, a bit of a contentious space potentially. And, and my feelings about town hall, um, schools, a, the police department, and we don't have any courthouses here, but if we did, it is that those should be neutral spaces uh, because I feel that in being neutral, it is actually more inclusive uh, than putting up a sign, you know, that on its, on its face uh, is trying to make us a better place and, and, and a more inclusive place. And certainly the uh, Black Lives Matter is, is, is important uh, and, and it, is, it is, I want to see that movement succeed and get as much out of this moment as it can, just as I am all in favor of gay pride. But when I try to put myself in someone else's position, like if there was a sign up there that says family equals one man and one woman, or a sign that says, you know, we value life, then for me going into town hall seeing that would make me just feel a bit excluded. And even though I support the all of these things, and I'm, I'm in favor of having the use of government space to espouse the values of the town, i.e. The, the polls, or maybe we could come up with some other space. I mean, I just feel that there are some places where we need to make it clear to everyone we, that, that this, is, this town not so much represents you, but, but, but that this is, is your town and, and we're gonna work with you. And, and, and for those of us who are on the you know, leading the edge in progressive values, I mean, we just have to keep in mind that some people are coming along a, more slowly. A, and I don't mean to sound, I know that probably sounds condescending and patronizing, that's not my point. But the point is that we, we just need to be, diversity is not only simply diversity of how people look, we in their race, but it's also diversity of thought. A, and we need to provide that space a, for them and make every critical place in town, especially the, the, the places where they go to, go to conduct government business to be a welcoming space for them. On the pragmatic side, uh, I support the town manager on, on this. It, uh, uh, it, I know where his heart is and, and I trust in his thinking process. It, he has gotten a lot of input. It, it, he has a good sense of, of the, the the space in which we are dealing, and I have confidence in him. And and even if I don't particularly agree with the eventual outcome of this, I think this is a good place to be. And part of the support is 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 even if I don't necessarily agree with everything, uh, I can support the decision. And so that's why I enthusiastically second this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also agree with um, my previous colleagues and the town manager's um, suggested course of action. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that um, all sides around um, the Black Lives Matter banner um, do not get too overly fixated on the banner. Uh, the other thing that is important to me as the town manager works with the Human Rights Commission is that um, I'd like to see um, at least half, if not more, a majority of people of color um, consulted on um, this issue and other issues. Uh, I'm, I'm very um, heartened by the fact that the town manager and the Human Rights Commission, um, chaired by Crystal Haynes, along with Jill Harvey, our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, coordinator, um, are reaching out. Um, to persons of color, especially through, I always like to talk about high school students, whether they be athletes or not, but especially with the inclusion of the Arlington High School Black Student Union uh, and uh, alumni group, I can tell you myself personally, having um, coached for a little over a decade at um, Arlington High School, um, I think I could with any other sport or maybe even um, out of Gilbert and some arts and drama, uh, a majority of my former cheerleaders, um, some Arlington residents and some not, 
are still active as um, alumni um, and um, have been very visible and um, and they have stressed to me the importance over um, yes the Black Lives Matter banner is um, appropriate at the time right now but just as important if not more important is exactly what the town is doing with the community conversations on racism and reform I'm pleased that when I go on there, um, I don't see all white men and women. I see, um, I think, appropriate panelists for uh, including people of color. My daughter-in-law falls into that. Um, and I think really, if I had to focus, I had to pick one thing, um, I think that's um, something that should be one of the main drivers of how Arlington talks about our values um, and continues to talk about it so that um, my biggest fear is we, I honestly thought back in 1991, 92 with the beating of Rodney King and the, and the acquittal at his trial, and um, that also was on television and media, um, shocked that that kind of went away. And what I've heard from um, people of color is that um, they want to start laying the foundation um, and it's going to have to be many, many things, not just one thing, that we put in place for the future so that we don't backtrack and we put something in place that cannot be ignored in the future. And um, I, I'd like to thank Arlington through the town manager, Human Rights Commission, and the DEI um, coordinator um, have really laid out a good roadmap on how to do that. And most importantly, when I've spoken to them and and former students and um, family members is that if everyone just works together respectfully, um, even if you hear something that for some reason, you know, raises the hair on your back of your neck or whatever, that if everyone taking them sincerely for, for what they're saying is, I think the community conversations and what steps we take coming from out of that is a really, as I said, important driver to um, make sure that we actually learn from current day history, something we didn't do back in the 90s, and we as residents, citizens, and uh, leaders of the town um, basically put in something that cannot be ignored in the future so that we continue, continue to move forward and not have to have, oh, that's what happened in 2020, and here we are in another decade. decade. So uh, I apologize for being so lengthy on that, but um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. DeCorsi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I also support Mr. Caro's motion, and we had um, endorsed or, or voted the proclamation on, on June 8th, and it, it was just a short time ago, and, and at the time, um, you heard from Mr. Chaplin earlier that, that this month went by very quickly there we haven't completed the webinars there is still an ongoing dialogue in the community in 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 and in the nation and it just feels like it, this is not the time to to bring down the banner so i support the the, the motion and and um, look forward to continued conversations and speaking of the webinars one of them is tomorrow night and it's a it's an opportunity to listen tomorrow morning uh, tomorrow night rather um, to the, the uh, titles of suppressed voices. And it's an opportunity for the community to listen. We still have a few more left and there's still much to do. So I look forward to hearing back from the town manager and continuing to work, continuing to listen and continuing to talk. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. And I, again, I will support the motion as well. Um, you know, I, we, back in June, we raised this banner in response to a horrific event, but that came within the midst of a couple of years that we've spent working to raise awareness for institutional racism, both in the town and abroad. And, you know, we did that in June, shoulder to shoulder with our APD. And, you know, at the time, the, I think the length of time that we put in the proclamation made sense. But as we're still continuing these conversations, um, it's it's not the time to take it down. And then I look forward to hearing back from the town manager in a few months with a, a long-term plan, as well as a plan for the use of the space in general. So, you know, in the future, we can have a little clearer cut, you know, 
idea of what we're, we're looking for when we put any banner up at, in this location. Um, so I'll support the motion as well. All right, so I have a motion from Mr. Carl, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Heim? Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Sorry, did we get Mr. Diggins' vote? Mr. Diggins, was that a yes? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my connection is a little unstable, so sorry about that. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. All right, so this brings us to our citizens open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. So we'll open up the list for our citizens open forum. If you can use the raise hand function on your Zoom app. And I apologize if someone can remind me what the key code is on if you're you're um, calling in on the phone. I believe it's star nine. Star nine. Okay. All right, we, we have four hands raised right now, Mr. Hurd. Okay, you can start reading them to me. Lynette Culverhouse. Yep. Catherine Conley. Yep. Chris Loretti. And Elizabeth Dre. All right. I'll give a few more seconds to see if anyone else raises their hand. All right, we'll start with Lynette Culverhouse. You're muted, Lynette. Hi, my name Hi, is- Culverhouse, if you can say your name and address for the record. My name is Lynette Culverhouse and I live on Draper Ave. Um, I wanna um, thank the town manager um, and the select board for um, supporting, uh, keeping the Black Lives Matter banner up. Um, and I would like to suggest that it remains up until um, the black community says that it's no longer necessary. And by the black community, I don't just mean a select number of uh, token black people, but uh, reaching out and hearing from our black community in um, the food pantry and affordable housing, um, all of the black community needs to feel safe in this town. And until all of them do, this banner needs to remain up, whether it's a token or not. Um, it is performative, but it's also a message. And I think it's important to keep it up. Um, I am a proud member of Arlington Fights Racism, a group that's been fighting systemic racism in our town since a racist police officer was allowed to retain his job after publishing hate-filled and racist articles in a statewide publication. I would like to read you our mission statement. We are a committed group of Arlington residents striving to promote a more compassionate, inclusive, engaged and welcoming town by collaborating and networking with others to increase diversity, dismantle racism, bias and inequity, and to create a richer, more culturally representative community and town government. We have been working hard to define ourselves and make our voices heard for over a year and a half. In that time, we have been criticized, insulted, ignored, sidelined, 
and during the recent campaign maligned by many of our town leaders. I'd like to read our mission again. We are a committed group of Arlington residents striving to promote a more compassionate, inclusive, engaged, and welcoming town by collaborating and networking with others to increase diversity, dismantle racism, bias, and inequity, and to create a richer, more culturally representative community and town government. Now, please tell us what in this statement has been so distasteful to our leaders and their followers. I have yet to understand why so many people would oppose the inclusion of marginalized voices in our town government. What about our mission statement is so threatening? Perhaps sharing power with marginalized people is hard. Whatever it is, I hope we can all move on and do the work, our own personal work of overcoming our egos and biases to ensure that every voice in Arlington is valued, encouraged, and heard, even when those voices might be hard to hear, even when those voices may not follow our own personal interpretation of civility. We were promised by Ms. Chap Chapterlane that he would include AFR in the planning of any townwide events related to anti-racism. We have not been consulted about any of the recent events planned and held by the town to address racism. I can't imagine- Overhouse, you're at three minutes right now, if you can just wrap up. Almost finished. Sentence. Almost finished. I can't in my heart understand why, unless it's a conscious decision <laughs> to it. I hope that's not the case, but either way, we were not included in the planning. We are the ones who raised this issue and have worked tirelessly to bring our own systemic racism into the light and with the opposition of most of the town establishment. <laughs> Truly, town leaders can now show a little humility and have the integrity to act without malice and give AFR the respect it has earned. We have not wavered in our- House, if you can please wrap up. You're so far, about three and a half minutes here. One-way street. We will continue our work with or without you and continue to wait patiently for you to include us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Catherine Conley. Hello. Hi, Ms. Conley. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear yep. me? Okay. Hi, Ken, I'll... if you can just say your name and address for the record. Sure. It's um, good evening, everybody. I'm Kathy Connolly, um, uh, and I live on Forest Street in Arlington. And tonight I am speaking um, uh, on the Padrini case and the restorative justice process used by the town leadership to handle this issue. I've lived in Arlington for 16 years, and I really love living here. In my neighborhood, the streets are safe enough that children play outside on a regular basis. They ride their bikes, they have squirt gun bites, and they decorate the sidewalks with chalk drawings. Adults tend to their gardens, they run and cycle around the neighborhood, or they just enjoy sitting on their porches watching all this activity. I want every human, um, a human being to have the opportunity to live here and experience this because it seems like a safe, secure, and good place to live. That is, unless you are a person of color, an immigrant, a protester, or an other. How can anyone be safe when our town continues to employ um, a cop, Lieutenant P Pedrini, who published racist, hate-filled writings on a statewide police website? directed at the community and the people he serves. Lieutenant Pedrini, with his racist beliefs, is responsible for protecting and serving our community. He carries a gun, he earns a high salary, and the fact that he was not fired immediately is a stain and a smear on the reputation of our town, its citizens, civil servants, town leadership. Instead, the town leadership used a restorative justice process to handle this issue. The risk assessment used to consider and select restorative justice was not transparent to the community. The restorative justice process itself was not transparent. The process was not followed correctly. Steps were skipped or fast-tracked to benefit Pedrini. And the community was not fully involved uh, except for select individuals. The restorative justice process used to discipline Pedrini is widely viewed among Arlington citizens and residents as a failure 
and is not representative of our culture or values. When we come together on August 4th, I ask two things. One, that the town leadership does not compound this bad decision by closing this case and labeling it a success. This will set a dangerous precedent that is forever linked to Arlington. And two, I also ask that community members be able to speak directly to Pedrini, unfettered by the town select board or the manager. In closing, I ask, how can we be proud of our community and our town when our leadership and the decisions they make enable racism? This is never acceptable, not then and not now. How do we diversify our town and build a more inclusive culture? This is 2020 and there's a huge wave of change coming. What side will you be on? Where is your moral courage and leadership on this issue? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Conley. Here we have Christopher Loretti. Chris, I think you just have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. I'm here to address the June 29 letter from Attorney Robert Anessi, which you included as correspondence received in the agenda for this meeting. I'm disappointed that you chose not to also include my response as I requested. I ask that you do so with your next agenda. I will not spend much time addressing Mr. Anessi's baseless, baseless attack against me. I would refer you and anyone listening to the website for Arlington Residents for Re Responsible Redevelopment, ARFRR.org. And under meetings, you can watch the June 23 hearing on 339 Massachusetts Avenue. There you, you will see how far off base Mr. Anessi's comments are about me. And more importantly, you will see how baseless his comments are concerning the chair of the ZBA, Kristen Klein, and you'll see what a fine job Mr. Klein did running the meeting. Mr. Nessi does make a couple excellent points in his letter, however, one that your, board's, your board needs to address. First, the select board must improve the administrative process for special permits, both those acted on by the ZBA and the ARB. It can do that by making enforcement of zone, Arlington zoning bylaw a priority. Far too many special permit applications are directed to the ARB and ZBA without adequate prior review. Hearings turn into a game in which attorneys seek to privilege their clients with violations of the zoning bylaw by telling them, by telling the special permit granting authority it may grant relief even when the zoning bylaw does not allow it and a variance is required. This has happened multiple times for mixed use development proposals, including the Toraya Block redevelopment and Hotel Lexington. Second, Mr. Anessi quite properly raises the issue of ex-party communications with members of quasi-judicial boards in the course of a public hearing. The select board needs to ensure that all written communications with the boards are promptly posted to a web page created for each hearing docket so that all interested parties have equal access to them. The select board also needs to put an end to private meetings between one or more ARB members and interested parties during the course of a hearing. To buy knowledge that never happened when I served on the ARB, and it should not be happening now. It has occurred with the Triad development, which Mr. Nessi represents, and I also understand with Hotel Lexington. From Mr. Nessi's letter in my email response, as well as public comments, it should be clear to the, to the select board that neither the applicants and their attorneys nor residents are satisfied with the way the special permit processes, processes are working. I suspect the same is true for ARB and ZBA members themselves. I ask, that the select board, I ask the select board to take these issues seriously and work to achieve a prompt and equitable resolution. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Elizabeth Dre, and then after that we have Sherry Barron. Ms. Dre. All right, Elizabeth, we have you. You just need to unmute yourself. Hi, 
Hi, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Select Board. I'd, uh, Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street. I'd like to thank you um, for your decision tonight about the Black Lives Matter banner. Um, and I would ask that uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, when you do um, get people together and uh, include community stakeholders, that you invite Arlington Fights Racism and the Diversity Task Group to also participate in that discussion. Um, but on a different note, I'd like to ask again, I've asked this before, that participants in these meetings be allowed to see each other um, during the meetings as we would normally be able to see each other if we were attending a select board meeting in person. Um, I don't understand why we can't see each other. Um, I don't understand why we can't know who else is on this call and in this virtual meeting with us. I don't know what the legal precedent is, um, if, there, if there even is one. Um, I believe there's options that we can see each other and you can keep us muted until it's our turn to talk to prevent disruption. But I, I really don't understand why we cannot see who else is on this call with us. It just makes no sense to me. Um, and I'll finish by just following up um, on the email I sent to Chair uh, uh, Mr. Hurd about this renaming the Citizens Open Forum um, to Residents Open Forum. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I'll touch on that in new business. All right. And Sherry Barron. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, Ms. Barron. I, hi, everyone. Sorry. Um, I had no intention of speaking. Otherwise, I wouldn't look like Daisy May. But um, I've been in the garden a lot today. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, if you don't mind, I, just, sorry, if you could just state your name and address. Barry Barron, 10 Raleigh Street, Arlington. Thank you. I'm a member of the Human Rights Commission, but I'm speaking for myself this evening. I didn't quite hear the um, the resolution of the banner, although I heard that it would stay up until something. Um, I, I'm very concerned that the banner and the sentiment behind it reaches the audience that it ought to reach. Um, I mean, who is the banner up for? And how do we want people in our town, people of color, to feel? And in that question, why aren't we asking them what they want in terms of where the banner should hang? I'd like to see the banner go up Mass Ave and spend time at a variety of different places. I know that there are people, Elizabeth Dre, for example, is suggesting that it stay at the either town hall or, or the police department to represent the town's commitment to this. But we are not the audience. We're not the people who need to feel safe and secure and feel that our town is behind them and willing to do what it takes to help make this better. I don't know what that is, but how are we involving the real uh, buyers of this. I, I'm not clear how that's happening and I would like to see that happen. I'd like to for you people, you folks, to determine who you're, I mean in, in advertising you you build your campaign for your audience. Who's your audience here and who and what do we want this banner to say to them and how do we know that? I don't know that. I'm a white middle-class Jewish woman, and I haven't felt this. How do we do that? I'd like to see a plan for for that kind of of a um, collaboration to come to a, a decision or come to a a, a a plan protocol for how do we how we do that? How do we make people feel that? this banner really represents what they needed to feel. Thank you, Ms. Barron. 
Thank Great. You. So that closes Citizens Open Forum. As always, to residents, any other comments or questions you have, you can forward them to the board via email. That takes us to traffic rules in order. First is item number eight on our agenda, a re request for, for a memorial for Daniel Rossetti, Otto X. Cordero, Associate Professor at MIT. And Ms. Chaplin, do we have Mr. Cordero with us? All right. Okay, Mr. Cordero, we have you there and I see that you're now unmuted. So if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your request. Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Otto Cordero. Um, I live in Medford and I'm a professor at MIT. Uh, a member of our department, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. Someone who has been with us since 1990, 1996. Um, Recently, uh, her son died in tragic circumstances. She lives in, in Arlington. She has lived in Arlington for, for many years. Uh, her son was 27 years old when he passed away um, on June 30. And uh, it is my understanding from, from talking to Denise, she is the name of our colleague, that um, there were many moments formative, in uh, formative years of Daniel that happened in, in Arlington along the bike, bike path the Boys and Girls Club, etc. And so we thought that a way to bring some solace to the family was to have a, a small memorial. Um, and I'm not an expert, I don't have experience in, in these matters, but we were thinking something um, uh, something like a tree, perhaps a, a, a bench with a small plaque that says in memory of, something of that nature. And uh, of course the specifics we, we will need to, to adjust because I, I, I don't know exactly what, how these things work. And, uh, and uh, the department and my laboratory, we, we, we will be happy to, 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 to uh, make a contribution if this is pertinent uh, to the town. And, and that's more or less the, the, the case. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you. And I will open it up to the board if they have any questions, comments, or motions. Uh, Mr. Carl. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, first, my condolences on, on this uh, tragic loss. It's, it's a very um, kind gesture of you to come forward and on, on behalf of your, um, your colleague. And um, so I, I would like to move that we refer this request to the Public Memorials Committee. Uh, that's our usual pro process. Thank you. And Ms. Mahan? Um, I definitely will wholeheartedly um, second that, uh, as well as ex extend my condolences. And I want to thank um, Mr. Cadero, Otto, and um, the others that worked with works with this Arlington resident. And I know sometimes your work fellow employees become your work family. Um, and I'm very grateful that you're taking the steps to try to find some way. <clears throat> to provide some outlet grieving. Um, my only thing, and I'm assuming it's going to be you, Otto, um, I've, uh, having gone through this a very tragic death in my family many years ago, um, I'm always caught, I'm aware of the fact that if the family member just doesn't feel she's in the right place to um, participate, she's certainly welcome that somebody, and I assume it would be you, Otto, be the point person to, um, you know, and it may be she just, you know, she's not in that point. She wants this, but so I just would put that to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're right. I, I agree with everything you said. I've been in contact with her. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank Professor Cordero for the for the letter and um, my condolences to the to the Rossetti family, and I certainly support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Dickens. Yes, I support the motion too. And, uh, and, and every every death is important uh, to the the people that remain. Me, but having had uh, my mom lose um, by her 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 daughter, my sister, yeah, I know how much it really um, impacts a parent. And so any anything that. Um, that we can do uh, to help um, with that process. It's great. I don't know what the um, 
a memorial committee will do, but I hope they do something that uh, helps in the process. So uh, thanks for coming to us. Yeah. Yep, and I just add, you know, my condolences to the family after a tragic loss, but my heartfelt thanks to you and your department for stepping up and, you know, having even just the idea to come and do this and then following through with it and seeing this to the end to put something up that to memorialize this, this tragic life loss. So we have a motion by Mr. Carl, seconded by Ms. Mahan to refer this matter to the Public Memorials Committee. Attorney Heim? Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Dickens? Yes. Mr. Curio? Yes. Mr. Yes. Unanimous vote. All right, thank you. And thank, thank you, Mr. You Cordero. Much. Thank you very much. Item number nine under traffic rules and order. We have a request for a memorial bench for Stan Resendez from Kathy and Kathleen Resendez. Do we have a member of the Resendez family with us? Hi, Ms. Resendez. So we have you with us. You just need to unmute your computer. Or star nine. Is it star nine, Mr. Chair, the, on the phone? Uh, six to unmute yourself. Let me, uh, let me see if I can help her out here. Unmute. I think we've got it now. Thank yep. you. We can hear you now. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, this is my mother, Kathy Resendez. I'm Kathleen Resendez. We have lived in Arlington since my parents bought the house on Dorothy Road. We lived there since 1966, back when the bike path was an operational B&M railroad. And um, so uh, we uh, are interested also, we have in common with Mr. Cordero, and we also want to praise him for stepping up and, and helping his colleague. It's a very noble thing to do. Um, we are interested in donating, the possibility of donating a bench in memory of my father, Stan Resendez, who passed away in 2014, uh, just before his 82nd birthday. And I'll let my mom speak a bit. Our remarks are brief. My husband and I walked the bike path well into our 80s and many times stopped at the bench at Lake Street, and we often um, thought how nice it would be to have a bench on the opposite side of Lake Street. And so I would be interested in donating a bench that would be on the even side of Lake Street that would be a twin to the other one uh, insofar as this made of recycled material. And we did a little bit of homework. We um, had the privilege of uh, the goodness of Arlington's uh, town leaders that we could find out some information before we joined this meeting. And in particular, we received the public memorial criteria from, and forgive me if I don't pronounce the name right, Mr. Alexander Salapante. And as we read it, we recognize that while my father was a wonderful man and a great father, um, and he has military service, he was in the Arlington Minutemen in the early days of that, and he attended with my mom meetings, uh, visualizing the railroad tracks becoming today's bike path. Uh, we don't believe he meets the criteria that's specifically listed in this document from 1988. Um, that was just mailed to us in this long-standing document. So we're looking to do this uh, from one family to the people who live and visit Arlington, that they would have a nice bench to sit on when they're out walking, especially those people who may have in, uh, difficulty walking, they have a spot to rest and sit for a couple minutes before they walk again. And we're inspired particularly by the precedent that exists in Squamscott over by Hawthorne's by the sea, uh, by King's Beach on the sidewalk there, there are several benches donated by families in honor of their loved ones. And, and we're looking to do the same. We would look to you for guidance regarding what next step we should take. Also, 
what would be the cost and um, would the town pay for the installation uh, granted that this proposal would be approved. We would like to donate the bench very much uh, because the bike path was special to myself and my husband over the years. Thank and they, you. they biked well into the 60s too. Um, but also with our, uh, I, I think I'm ready to close. With yeah. You. yeah. We, we want to say thank you for the opportunity and the time and the consideration that we could come forward to um, your board and, and ask about this. And uh, we are interested in, in exploring the steps and moving forward with your guidance. All right. Thank you. And let me ex first express my condolences for the thank loss you, thank you. of your husband and father. Um, and just thank you for your willingness to do this and to help beautify the town and honoring your husband and father as well. So for this one, I will turn to Ms. Mahan for any comments, motions. I'd like to um, make a motion that we also refer this to the Public Memorials Committee. And I believe they're meeting on July 27th. Um, and um, Mrs. Resendez and Kathleen, um, same way you uh, zoomed in or accessed this meeting, you would do that in that case. I do wanna say um, I met a few times through Kathleen in my days as a page at the Robbins Library, um, her mom and dad, um, who were always so respectful, always cared so deep, deeply and still cares deeply um, about the town of Arlington. Um, we're gr great husband and wife team, uh, best friends and supporters of each other. So um, I, I definitely want to thank Mrs. Resendez and Kathleen um, for coming forth and doing this um, for your dad, who was a great man and, and continues to be. Um, <laughs> I, I, just because he's not here doesn't mean he isn't still great. Um, and, and we'll certainly work through um, the Public Memorials Committee. I, I understand you read the guidelines, I think from 1988, but um, we always try to, as things come in, find a way to get things done. Um, and perhaps there needs to be some other language added or edited um, for that. So uh, I certainly stand um, committed to uh, working with you, Kathleen, and Mrs. Resendez, as well as the Public Memorial Committee. And thank you for doing this. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Diggins? Yes, and, and you know, my condolences too. And, and, and um, as I said, I mean, it doesn't matter the age of the person that has deceased to me. They're important to everyone. It's always good to see someone trying to make something positive uh, out, of, um, out of a loss. Uh, and uh, like I said, I don't know how things work uh, in the uh, memor memorials committee. You know, certainly don't want to try to pressure them to do anything. But I do like the idea of a bench. You know, as someone who walks a lot and walks along uh, uh, the bike path, you know, I'm often carrying things. And it's nice to have a place to stop sometimes and just uh, rest a little bit. And and when I do see these memorials, I see the name, and I and <laughs> it's um. Even if you don't know them, you, you know that someone cared and, uh, and, and it had the resources to, to, to do something like that. So I hope it works out for you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. And Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Mrs. Resendez and, and Kathleen um, for the remembrance of your, of your husband and, and, and father and uh, I support the motion and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to, to work with you uh, on this uh, with the uh, Memorials Committee and perhaps uh, through the uh, Department of Public Works as well. I just want to stress, you know, I thank you for your attention, but I want to stress to us the importance of it being recycled material. We don't want one of those wire benches. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Carl. Thank you very much. Um, I've heard all my colleagues supporting this. I don't know if there's a formal second, so if there isn't, I'm, I'm happy to formally second um, thank you. Ms. Mahan's motion. Um, and, and thank you. This is just it's very thoughtful, the way that you have approached this and, and, and thinking of a place that, that had so much meaning for, um, for you um, and, and your, your husband and father, um, but, but also um, 
you know, fits with the, the amenities that we have there and will serve others. Um, so I'm happy to refer to the Memorials Committee. I, I see that you talked to uh, Mr. Amstutz. So I, I think you're yes, probably yes. aware that we it's were- very helpful. Yeah, I think you're aware that we're about to have some work at that um, yeah. intersection. Yes. So I trust that um, that this would fit in with, with the, the plans um, uh, there. But um, so thank you very much. We hope so. it's, it's a wonderful uh, way to uh, honor your uh, um, father and husband. Just one last question. I was curious in the uh, course of the work they're going to do, do they have any plans on putting a flowering tree there on that side? Because there is one on the other side, but there isn't any, there isn't any on the uh, even side. Mr. Chapterling, do you know the answer to that? So I, I do know there's a large amount of planting that's planned. I don't recall if there's a flowering tree or not, but I could, um, I, I can look into it and I, I can find a way to contact you, Mr. Zendis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and again, just thank you for your willingness to step up and not just remember your husband and father, but also to do it in a way that helps the community. So we appreciate that. So I have a motion to refer this to the Public Memorials Committee by Ms. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Caro. Attorney Heim. Mr. Chair, may I just offer one uh, quick observation that might be helpful to the yes. um, Folks, I obviously share in uh, offering condolences and uh, echo the discussion of this wonderful board. Uh, but I, I, right, I don't know if it's just my speaker, but I'm having trouble hearing you. He's love for me too. Yeah, but I can, can folks hear me now? Yes. Yeah. I just want to echo the board's uh, condolences and the lovely sentiments they expressed. I do want to let you know that there may be an additional um, layer to this because the MBT, the, the bike path is licensed to the town from the MBTA. We uh -huh. always want to make sure that anything that we're putting up as a memorial uh, is, stays for a long time, obviously. So I okay. just want to let, give you guys the heads up that as this goes to the Public Memorials Committee, one thing that we'll just have to try to look at is what the dividing line is between the MBTA bike path and Town of Arlington proper. I'm sure we can work it out, but I just wanted to give you the heads up on that. Thank okay, you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. That, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I will. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. And thank you to Mrs. Resendez and Mrs. Okay. Rosendez. Thank you, thank you. All right, and this brings us to item number 10, under traffic rules and order, discussion of potential approval and potential approval of parklets in Arlington Heights. Do we have generate our Director of Planning and Community Development, Allie Cotter, our Economic Development Coordinator, and Dan Anstutz, our Senior Transportation Coordinator with us? We have Ali and Dan. Jenny is doing double duty at an ARB meeting and they're still in the middle of a hearing. So I think we're in very capable hands with Ali and Dan and Jenny will join us when she can. Okay, thanks. Okay. Ali, do you want to kick this off? Would you like me to share the presentation or would one of you share? Or? I can share it. Okay. Oh. oh. Actually, Adam, maybe you should. I think I just gave you permission. Oh, okay. There we go. Screen. All right. Um, thank you all for having me back here again tonight. My name is Allie Carter. I'm the Economic Development Coordinator in the Department of Planning and Community Development and um, bringing um, some more ideas from the Arlington Economic Development Recovery Task Force. Again, trying to be responsive to um, our residents' uh, needs that they expressed in the consumer survey uh, for more outdoor uh, opportunities for conducting commerce and supporting local businesses. So tonight we bring you to Arlington Heights. Um, and we're discussing parklets in Arlington Heights, a particular need there. Um, this 
in this instance, parklets would be um, outdoor seating and dining setups in parking spaces. So why parklets, why now? Well, according to our survey, um, people want as many outdoor options as possible um, and to shop and dine places where proper social distancing protocols are in place and um, maximizing online curbside low contact options as long as we're living with COVID as a threat. So um, we did a little bit more of a public process this time. We put out a poll. It was open for one week, um, pretty short period of time. We presented five parklet options in Arlington Heights. We got 806 responses in a week, which is pretty impressive, or I was impressed. I'll just speak for myself. Um, and so we wanted to create options because those sidewalks in Arlington Heights are so narrow and the business owners were having a hard time just figuring out how to configure these spaces. And so we thought we'd come up with a bunch of concepts for them. Um, so we put the survey out by town channels um, and with the help of groups like Support Arlington Heights um, and through our task force members as well. Um, and uh, two came out as the clear favorite. So we're just going to focus on those two as the proposed options um, for tonight. So these are, this is a temporary seating installation at 1346 through 1360 Mass Ave, essentially from the roasted granola through Galaxy Market and Szechuan Dumpling on the south side of Mass Ave. Um, and so it could provide seating for one or two of these businesses. Um, one expressed definite interest in the other two um, less, but we're still supportive, um, just not for having outdoor seating themselves. Um, and the second uh, one that public seemed to like the most was um, also on the south side of Mass Ave um, and in front of 1306 and 1308 Mass Ave, which has long time been a vacant building, but also extending over to the next building um, in front of the home taste restaurant. And um, I actually spoke with them and they're not ready at the moment to have their own licensed outdoor seating, but they still would welcome um, like public seating there um, to allow people to take their takeout and eat it um, nearby. Um, so we got uh, some really great comments about this in the survey. People loved that we were bringing this strategy forward, um, that we need to save the local businesses while protecting our health, do these more, do them fast, lots of excitement. Um, and Arlington Heights has always needed more outdoor eating spaces, um, which is something we heard when we were making the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan as well. So for approval, uh, what we're asking for is um, to prohibit parking on 12 feet of curb length immediately west, oh, actually, yeah, I'm gonna back up for a second to explain that. Um, for this particular, that should have been the last um, bullet point, sorry, but for this particular installation, you can see over on the left side of the screen, there's this little piece of curb just on the west side of that crosswalk that's really short, um, but people still kind of park there illegally all the time, and it's not great for um, pedestrian safety, um, and so we thought while we were asking for this parklet, <laughs> we would ask to prohibit parking there too. Um, save us another meeting. Um, repurpose approximately four parking spaces because the spaces aren't striped in the heights from 1346 to 1360 Mass Ave to convert to a seating area and repurpose approximately five parking spaces between 1306 and 1312 Mass Ave to convert to a seating area. That's it. Thank you. Good. All right. And I'll move to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll, I'll move approval of the uh, creation of the park parklets as contained in the report and the uh, removal of the parking spot. And I, I want to thank Ms. Carter for the uh, presentation and, and then Mr. Amstutz as well for his work. Um, on it, and I, when we spoke with Ms. Rake at, at an earlier meeting about creating more dining options in the center, that's just one of the questions that came up. What can we do in other parts of town? So I'm glad to see that you came back to us on this, and and fully um, that this can help the businesses up and.
Thank you. And Mr. Diggins? I'm happy to second it. And, and I'd like to express my appreciation to Ms. Carter for sending me a, that information that I asked for um, in her previous presentation, where she was telling us about the um, psychology behind the people. Um, well, the, the psychology of, of how they feel about the, uh, being outdoors or, or being more active as, as we deal with the um, pandemic. I, mean, I checked it out, the National Main Street Center is uh, quite an interesting organization, so I appreciate that. Uh, I, I noticed in the survey me, that there were some people that didn't want uh, these spaces. Did there, were there any comments from them? I'm kind of curious as to what they may have been objecting to. Or Yes, um, and thank you for bringing that up. Sure. Sometimes I just rush through these things, but you'll see that there were some people, 47 said, or do not want anything like this in the Heights. Um, and <laughs> That is fair. Many, there are lots of folks who don't want any parking to be disrupted at all, ever. Um, but when I think compared to the other responses, the you know majority of the responses were favorable, and also when you compare it to um, the consumer survey and the response we got from that, that people prefer these options, um, I, I think. Um, it made us feel comfortable bringing this proposal forward. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm comfortable too. I mean, I'm just always interested I mean, in the other point of view I mean, and the arguments that they're making and then the rebuttal to it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I just would say the fourth part of the motion that Mr. DeCourcy um, spoke about I know exactly where that area is, right by the crosswalk. It barely can fit a compact car or a car that just is a two-seater. But I have been up there for the past years, and I've had a lot of business owners um, concerned about citizens crossing in that crosswalk. Because sometimes you'll even see a commercial truck or something. And, and I've spoken to people when I've stood there. When they come back and I've said, you know, this is not safe. It's not a crosswalk. And they say, well, it kind of, it doesn't say it's not a parking space and it looks like one, even though they're blocking the driveway, uh, usually with at least a third of their vehicle of the cleaners that's right near Szechuan. I'm, I'm blanking on it. So um, I guess I would um, ask, suggest um, through the chair um, to Ms. Carter and Mr. Amstutz, um, if there's any way, um, everything we can do there if we could put i don't know what your plans are to put a no parking sign can you also paint the curb red um i don't think you can you know do something that someone parks there and alarm goes off but um it, and a lot of the people that i did talk to um said oh i i know it probably isn't a parking space but i'm just going in real quick so i really um if it's appropriate you, you know there may be some rule to say if you do a sign you can't do a red curb or vice versa but whatever you can do so that it will minimize the amount of people. You'll probably still have a few that do it because they've been doing it for so long out of habit. Um, but uh, for the rest of the people, the people who rightly or maybe not um, feigned that, oh, I thought it was a spot, is something you can clearly say, no, <laughs> we, we got you every way, it's not a spot. And it is dangerous to people crossing, it really is. Um, especially when they're you know coming in from Lexington going towards Arlington. And a lot of times, you know, they'll be looking at the light ahead and the pedestrian, you know, basically has to stick their head out to see if a car is coming and the person traveling on uh, Mass Ave, there's no way they can see that. Um, so, but thank you very much for all your work on that. And I'll leave that to um, the planning department, Ms. Carter and Mr. Amstutz for what we are allowed to do and what you think we should do. All right, Mr. Carl. Thank you very much, and thank thank you for this work. I'm very happy to see the the pace of of, uh, of uh, innovation coming through to, as we uh, enter um, uh, later reopening phases. I, I just wanted one one bit of clarification. Now, this is different from the outdoor seating that we outdoor licensed seating that we talked about in the center, right? So, um, with the parklets. Are we anticipating that the town is going to provide some of the furnishings for these? Um, not necessarily, no. So 
um, similar to in the center, we had a pretty clear um, sense of who would want to apply for what when we came to you that evening. So it seems like, you know, the, the restaurants would ask for permission and furnish their own spaces. In this situation, it, it actually is a little different. Um, so we know that the 1346 to 1360 space, there's at least one restaurant who would definitely make use of that space. And the other is could potentially be more of a public space. Um, and so we do, we're investigating sources of funding and support to get that um, seating, but not necessarily that the town would provide it. Okay, yeah, that's exactly what I was getting getting at because you had mentioned that, that, that the restaurant there said that they're not really interested in doing outdoor dining, but they'd, they'd be fine if there was a place for people to take their takeout. So furnishing it is gonna be important for this to be operable. So. But thank you for the work. Sure, thank you. Thank you, and I also will support this. We've all seen the data from the polls regarding the people's covering outside versus inside. So we need to do what we can to help all of our businesses, particularly our restaurants that need places for people to consume their food. And the one good thing about the Heights is up, up and down Park Ave, we have plenty of additional parking that people can utilize to, to access the businesses there. So I'm happy to support this. All right, so I have a motion by Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Hyde. Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Furo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Carter. I think you are done. And moving on to item number 11 on our, on our agenda under traffic rules and order, discussion of potential and potential approval, shared streets. So do we have Mr. Amsis, our senior transportation planner? Yes, thank you. And I will uh, share my screen with the brief presentation that I have. Thank you. All right. And everyone can see that. Okay. So I'm here to mostly provide an update on how things have been going with the shared streets after the pilot that we had on Brooks Avenue was um, done in late May. So I'll go through a few slides about kind of where the program could go next. And um, I'm Yes, where the program will go next, and we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, some different things that we can do with this program going forward. So where we are now, so again, with the, the pilot that we had on Brooks Avenue was very successful. I would say we got um, quite a lot of support for that. I think about three quarters of people um, were very uh, happy with it and did want it to come back. Um, this board approved a framework for the next steps um, at the June 1st meeting. And some of the lessons that we learned from the demonstration that we did on Brooks Ave was that some of the signage needs to be clear. As you can see from the picture on the right, there was some confusion about what local access means. Definitely some, um, what we learned was to have public engagement with the wider neighborhood, not strictly with the residents or property owners that are on the streets where we would do this. More types of traffic calming, um, even though the speed limit is 25, that still can feel quite fast for people that are trying to actually mix in on the street um, for traffic that's coming to, through, trying to get it somewhere down to more like 15 or 20 miles an hour is really more of the ideal situation. Uh, again, more messaging and interventions that might include it come with some of this traffic calming to say, this is a shared street and, and make it a little bit more consistent. Uh, leveraging volunteers, I think will be important as we move forward and perhaps not have as much, um, you know, we had support from the Lawrence and Lillian Solomon Foundation. So not having that, people that are living in the neighborhood that feel very strongly about this can, we could leverage them as volunteers to, to help with, you know, letting people know about it um, and sort of helping us look at this program more. And then there was lots of community interest, more than 120 shared streets nominations. And I'll talk about that a little bit more further. 
And this is more about the neighborhood level, um, you know, with um, what um, Ali Carter was talking about and with the, the work that we've done in the center is a bit more focused on commercial areas. This is more focused on the neighborhood areas, providing that additional street space for people to social distance and travel and recreate uh, actively as part of the COVID-19 response of the town. They need to get outside and be active and stay healthy, but also we need to try, they need social distance from one another. So as we talked about on June 1st, these ideas of localized interventions and sort of connected street networks that, um, you know, sort of more narrow versus more widespread. And I'll talk a little bit more of that, that later. Um, one of the first things I started looking at was the design guidelines of how we would do this. We had a sort of standard design when we did the demonstration. And so I've advanced that a little bit more so that we can have something that's consistent, incorporates more elements of traffic calming, and then again, trying to use the materials that we already have. But there is a grant program out there that we can look to to try to get materials that we don't have on hand and, and that will need to be out there for longer than sort of we can spare them. Um, so there's this idea of gateway treatments where when you're actually entering a street that you have a sign or, or information telling you that you're entering a shared street or a different space than what you might be used to. And the sort of hard and soft idea is more about with the Brooks Avenue pilot, we kind of try to direct traffic away from this entire zone and so divert traffic all the way around and to change that a little bit so that it's not quite so hard and fast where there's certain areas where you want to try to divert traffic in the larger in, in the larger intersections and um, not you know push it so hard on the smaller intersections. And then with the in-road traffic calming, these are different kinds of things that I'll talk about on the next slide that we can do with short-term uh, materials that can put on under the street. These are more of what I would call horizontal traffic calming. We're not uh, talking about putting in speed humps or things, although there are temporary things that you can do for that. The, so this is sort of the gateway idea, very similar to what you saw in the demonstration. There'd be a, you know, a larger uh, presence of two signs and saw a horse road closes through traffic at some of the major intersections. So like something coming off of Mass Ave, for example, whereas a smaller one would be just sort of a side street that would be part of the internal street network. And then this, again, these are the um, common traffic calming measures that you can do with short-term uh, you know, cones and signs and rubber curbs and different kinds of things, or these flex posts that you see on the second set of pictures right there for the curb extensions that can be installed and can sit out there for a little while, but they're not necessarily meant to be a long-term permanent solution. And so they can be removed. Um, if something isn't going right with them, or if, uh, say, winter is coming and we need to take them out. So, um, like the mini traffic circles, something that we've, I think the Public Works has looked into before, uh, that we more of like replacing a four-way stop or at a four-way intersection to try to slow traffic down. Um, the curb extensions are something that we're familiar with in terms of the really hardscape that you get through, say, the Mass Ave uh, redesign, for example, and the curb extensions through there, but this would be more of a temporary uh, measure to try to narrow the street so that it is not as wide as it appears, because the wider the street is and the more pavement space you have, the faster people are going to travel. And then chicanes to sort of make a car sort of slalom back and forth, again, to slow them down so they don't have kind of a visual um, viewpoint at the end of the street that's a straight on, which can easily lead somebody to just go uh, faster. Some potential projects that I started looking at are based, a lot of these are based off of the shared street nominations. Um, and also looking at, so, so partly looking at places where people want them. We don't want to necessarily try to impose a lot of this in certain areas, but also connective networks that are, that would require a bit more work. But we could start with some of these the, the neighborhood based areas and work off from there. Mary Street was mentioned quite a number of times, uh, Waldo Street and Amson Road. These are all in, the, in East Arlington. We didn't get as much from Arlington Heights, but I'll talk about that more. Um, and then an idea for the actually connected network is something from the Minuteman Bikeway to the Mystic River to be a sort of uh, alternative, try to take some pressure off the bikeway. This is what Brooks Avenue couldn't really do because it was too small and um, located it located you know very uh, discreetly and 
the Robbins Farm Park area is um, one idea I have that's later on. And then Ronald Road has actually come up. There are a number of residents that um, wrote to the town manager concerned about traffic speed. Um, and uh, that's another possibility. I had a conversation with them last week. Um, Mary Street, again, this could be more of um, similar to Brooks Road. It's a, it's a longer segment, but um, you can see some of the comments that we received. Um, we know that we put up a lot of these or no, no right turn signs or no left turn signs off of Lake Street during the um, rush hour periods. Uh, but still, there's certainly a lot of concern about cars going through there to try to get around traffic at Lake Street. And at the very least, if they're going through there, that they could be going slower than they are. Um, and so there's a lot of neighborhood community there that I think could be worked from that you know, to help gain support for this kind of project. Um, and then as kind of a bigger picture, if you see Mary Street on the right hand side, again, this is just a concept. Um, and you could have a type of connected street network that actually leads over to Monotomy Rocks Park utilizing the, the little, there's a little path that goes between Route 2 and Spy Pond. It's fairly narrow, but it's, um, it's a very interesting little, little spot that you can actually get from this side of Spy Pond to the other side without having to go all the way around on the north side of the, of the pond on the bikeway. And so this is, again, an idea uh, sort of formulating how you could work off Mary Street to get to something a little bit larger and more connective. Um, Waldoron and Amson Street, again, um, something that a number of people mentioned that, that lived on those streets. Um, lots of kids, people always, always certainly concerned about kids and road traffic and so on. Um, people being excited about the project, that's kind of what we're looking for, for so that people, um, again, that we, that there is um, support there already that can be worked off of. We don't want to, um, again, try to put this on people on a residential neighborhood that doesn't necessarily want to, to try it. Um, and then again, part of, if you see Waldo and Amsden Street right here on the sort of lower part of the map, this could be a way to connect over to Gardner Street. Um, Gardner Street was another one next to, you know, Monotomy Manor and so on that um, it came up a few times in the nominations. Uh, the reason why this kind of ends at the very top of the uh, map here is that, that, as that it is at that point that Gardner becomes a private way. And so that, again, we would still be able to get people to come through there, but um, that's sort of as far as we can go. We didn't want to get into issues about private ways through this type of program. Um, when it comes to, again, another idea to the Mystic River, um, the bikeway to the Mystic River, this goes, uses Orvis Road and Grafton Street um, and kind of works its way down to, uh, you know, either Everett Street or North Union Street over to the Mystic Valley Parkway where you have the Mystic River Path. You can get over to Medford as well. Uh, and so this could be another uh, direction to go, but I know that this would take a little bit more work. Um, for Arlington Heights, uh, um, for the nominations, we did not get as quite as much um, activity or, or interest from that side of the town for whatever reason. Um, there was, I think, some interest with Glenburn Road on the lower left hand side. And then again, with there are a number of private ways, especially in the Heights and on the sort of northwest side of Robbins Farm Park that make it extremely difficult to try to stitch something together without um, getting into what this means for private ways, which I can't, <laughs> I can't really answer that. But this would be a way to get, um, you know, to help people get more safely or more comfortably from the park down to the Whole Foods or down to the Stop and Shop and to other areas as part of town. This, there's sort of different ways of looking at this. This would be, could be accessed better more to um, essential services that are uh, right down there on Mass Ave. And so basically the next steps um, is that I'm planning to reach out to the residents who nominated Mary Street, Wald Road, and Amson Street. As I mentioned very briefly, I talked to uh, residents of Ronald Road last Friday about their concerns about how we could potentially use this program to try out some things. We've heard about um, Ronald Road and Washington Street. They talked about that intersection as being challenging and just speed on Washington Street was a concern. Um, and this provides, I mean, it puts, it 
provides a sort of challenge because it's it's a narrow street, it's a steep road, and um, sort of figuring out how to address traffic speed issues on those kinds of situations um, would be useful um, to understand how that we can we can do that better. Um, it's trying to returning the street, the shared street to Brooks Avenue, I think is important. Um, it was very successful, and we we sort of left it hanging a little bit, but um, having that back on Brooks Avenue and, and with this different approach to it with the different design and signage, I think would be uh, very good to continue with that. Uh, again, gathering support from the local residents on the street and the wider neighborhood is an important part of this. And then MassDOT has a shared streets and spaces grant for materials and implementation that um, is currently going right now, um, applications are being accepted on a rolling basis. It takes them about two weeks to review and, and potentially approve, and then we would need to actually implement it within 15 to 30 days. And so things like not just the shared streets, but also the outdoor dining and materials for doing parklets um, are, and bus lanes are actually all part of this. So there's, there's a lot of different um, projects that are eligible for that, that um, funding source. So um, that would be the idea. And talking with Public Works, we would need to order some more materials, get some funding to order some more materials so that they can be used for these applications because they have things that they use on a weekly basis that they can't sort of have tied up for weeks or months on end. And so that's the end. I think um, I would, so I would start having these conversations and then actually come back to the board at a later time to um, get approval for moving forward with these concepts before actually putting things down on the ground um, would be the idea. So thank you very much. Sorry about that. Whenever I mute myself. Um, I'll turn to Mr. Carl for any comments, questions, or motions. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate all of the work here. Um, I, I assume that you're looking for, at a bare minimum, you're looking for approval to reopen the um, the, the Brooks Ave shared space. Would, would that be correct? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Mr. Ansis? Um, uh, yes, I think so. Um, I think that would be, uh, like I said, it was very successful, and I think we'd, we would like to bring it back to, to show um, sort of continuing momentum with this um, and then start to see how we can connect that to other projects as well, other areas. Okay, so for a, the, the only thing you need really though is a motion right now is is uh, to, to reopen books. Right, the, um, the, other, the other areas are conceptual and um, we haven't done any outreach to the residents right now. So that's what would be the next step for those areas. Okay, so I, I, I'll make that motion to um, reopen the, the Brooks um, uh, shared streets area, um, I guess until, until, until the board until it comes back to the board for, uh, for a, a change, or are you looking for a particular season? I mean, I assume you're not wanting this open during winter, or am I wrong? That would be correct. I think that um, I think that certainly with snow and ice and snow removal and so on, we would need to uh, remove these from the streets. So I, I think the idea is that they would live on for a few months, and we can do a reevaluation at that time. So probably through October into early November. Mr. Hurd, can I jump in quickly? Yes. I think I would suggest, um, if you're willing, Mr. Kuro, that we uh, have a check-in point at the start of school. Uh, so have a check-in point earlier than the onset of winter so that we can make, I you know, what school will look like this fall. I know it's still an active discussion, but um, I think having the, like a built-in opportunity to make sure that we're accounting and planning for school traffic impacts with the Brooks pilot, or the Brooks um, closure in particular would be key. Okay, so I'll make my motion in that form that we approve the uh, reinstatement of the Brook, Brooks Ave shared street uh, project and uh, to be discussed again after the commencement of, uh, of school. 
Um, so I just had a couple of comments and questions. So in the Brooks Ave um, follow-up through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Amstutz, did you get a sense of the, the ways or that, that this was being used or who was using this? Um, and I have, a, I have a reason for that, that question. I mean, were you getting a sense that it was mostly folks who were trying to get their kids out in the street you know, in a safe manner? or we're just looking kind of for a neighborhood hangout area, so to speak, where they could socially distance but still see their neighbors? Or were you getting a sense that people were actually using it as a, a um, uh, connecting route for, for uh, walking or biking? So off the top of my head, I definitely heard from several people that they felt more comfortable with having with biking in the street with their children. Um, I imagine some children, you know, that are um, old enough to bike on their own, but obviously still need their parents' um, guidance. And I think we didn't see much, or it was not obvious that there were people that were actually sort of using it from the bikeway, for example. We didn't sign it to say, you know, come to Brooks Avenue instead of using the bikeway. It's a pretty small section or a pretty small area that you wouldn't really get much uh, benefit out of making a diversion than in going back onto the bikeway since it's only about a little over a quarter of a mile. But I definitely heard and from the observations um, that we did and that Neighborways did was that um, it was people who were just who were walking with their children in strollers, um, families on bikes or just sort of traveling or walking for exercise. So we didn't get the sense that there was any sort of congregation happening with it. Okay. I mean, I was, I was just curious because I, I, I noticed that the, um, <clears throat> you said uh, Mary street and um, Amazon and Waldo. I mean, it, it seems to be similar of a similar character to, to Brooks where I could imagine that those are places where people are looking to get their kids out and they seem very different from some of the other concepts that, that you showed us, which are really much more intentionally focused on um, mm -hmm. building out an, 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 an alternate uh, pedestrian route and, and crossing major roads as well, which is uh, a, a little bit right. different, I think from, from these three, from Brooks and, and, um, and, and Mary right. Waldo and Amstel. Yes. Um, the idea is that you could build off of these into some larger network as this, the connected networks framework that um, I discussed at the beginning. And it, so, so people can use them to get somewhere as opposed to just sort of walk around in their um, own neighborhood or bike around in their own neighborhood, uh, excuse me, in their own, own neighborhood. Uh, so that would be the idea um, being and, and having people be able to do that again in a socially distant way and at the same time trying to address some of the long-standing concerns about uh, traffic speed which um, I think in a previous presentation talked about the um, issue of less although we are seeing an uptick of volume of course but having less cars uh, or having less vehicles leading to higher speeds because of just less congestion and um, you know, seeing that sort of vanishing point where you can just continue going straight on. So, um, so there's sort of a, a dual nature to this. Yeah, I mean, I think that point's well taken about the speed. I think it, as you look at some of those scenarios with the, the larger networks, I, I would just be interested in what kind of demand there is there for for a larger network like that. I mean, a lot of those mm. um, those routes look <laughs> at first blush. Um, I, I think a lot of those routes uh, have pretty good uh, sidewalk infrastructure, but I'm not not 100 percent sure. So, um, mm -hmm. just something to th to think about as you do your outreach. What, what kind of demand there would be for for those larger networks? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Diggins? 
I will second uh, Mr. Kiro's motion uh, and a couple of questions through you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, so um, it was interesting that you uh, weren't planning on taking this through uh, the winter or at least stopping before the winter because uh, even before COVID, it, I, I, tell, I found um, getting walking along sidewalks, especially once there's snow, uh, a little challenging it, uh, it, for, for two reasons. The, the pathways are usually smaller. It, and secondly, uh, even when people do um, diligently shovel their sidewalks, it, uh, uh, <laughs> in the daytime, it will warm up, melt, and then it, around the dark dusk when you're heading back home, uh, it glazes over. So I find myself trying to walk into the, walk in the streets uh, more just because it's safer. Uh, so uh, I understand that you're not planning on doing this during the winter, but it's just one thing to think about you know, if, in case you um, do consider going beyond the fall. Uh, and um, as with um, Ali, I'm interested in um, any negative feedback that you had about this and, and, and maybe your responses to it because cause I know that we're going to get some. Thank you. Um, sure. Um... To the first point, I think um, that's certainly well taken about when the winter comes and there's lots of snow and everything, <laughs> it's harder to travel in all kinds of ways. I think the trouble is, is that um, using things like saw horses or sandwich boards or, or things that are move, very movable means that they're also very easy to get uh, knocked around during the winter by snow plows and so on. Um, I, uh, so I don't think we've quite crossed that bridge. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I know some of the other cities, Somerville, Cambridge, you know, they use things like flex posts that tend to, um, I don't know how well they survive the winter, but um, those are a little bit more, more semi-permanent, I suppose, because they can be bolted into the ground and sort of knocked over and then come back again. So kind of depends on the materials that you use. But um, I think for this, uh, for this, I think we're not currently looking at something that permanent. Um, but uh, for the second point about um, the feedback, the so again, I'm thinking back to um, when it came to the the shared streets, uh, the pilot that we did or demonstration that we did on Brooks Avenue. Um, I think some of it that I recall was. Um, concerns about, I guess, how shall I put this? I guess removing the priority of, of people to be able to drive easily through these areas. Um, that was some of it. Some of it I would call sort of ideological that we just simply shouldn't be doing this. Um, there was concern about what I mentioned that sort of mixing people walking with, with vehicles and, and the speeds being too great. And, you know, the additional traffic calming is something that we can look at to try to deal with that particular concern. Um, there was concerns about congregating initially, but we simply didn't see that on Brooks Avenue. Again, it wasn't, um, we thought about having people, you know, dragging people from the bikeway onto Brooks, but we were concerned that that would lead to a crowding issue and we wouldn't, didn't want that. So those, those are the types of concerns that come to mind. Great. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a question that based on the Mr. Kerr's motion and um, you, what Mr. Chapdelaine had said on, on Brooks, are you looking to open up that shared street now and then revisit it in September, or, or is it, are we going to look at it in September based on what happens with school? I guess the way that I heard that is that, um, is that we would see if it has an impact, a significant impact on school traffic. Um, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not quite certain what, uh, what's going to happen with the, or what's expected to happen with the elementary schools with uh, the coming fall, since that on a number of places and up is up in the air. But um, I think one of the things that we would change um, would be probably putting less emphasis on 
um, trying to divert traffic away from this area to try to deal with some of the um, potential school traffic concerns. Um, one other thing that did come up was uh, changing the sort of scope of the area so that it wouldn't it wouldn't be a closure strictly or a diversion away from the intersection at Lake and Brooks, but would be pushed back to Chandler Street. Um, and that's that's an alternative that we could look at to allow for that school traffic circulation to continue around Chandler Street um, and not sort of try to try to hard stop right at Lake Street. Yeah, I did, and, and I'm glad you said that because that's uh, I would encourage you to do that. And what I was going to raise based on my question is, is there's work being done currently at that intersection related to the bike uh, the bike path crossing and the, and the new signalization that's going on there. So there's a lot going on at that intersection right now and probably will continue um, for a while. So to the extent that we're allowing that approval, I, I did encourage you to, to start at Chandler Street. That's a very good point. And um, I agree with that actually. <laughs> so I Thank would, uh, yes, so for, for this, I think we would uh, make that change to for the, the scope of the area. Okay. Thank Mr. you. Chair, That's I'm happy to adjust my motion accordingly. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second that. I'll second the adjustment. Yeah. All right. Um, and then Ms. Mahan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks for all the work on this. I know we're sort of because of COVID-19 trying to do as much as we can and, and expedite the process. And this is a, another form of that. Um, and I know you'll be coming back with what the actual application will be for the state grant um, shed street use program. And uh, my only point, um, I agree with what my colleagues have said and uh, amended. Uh, I know sometimes some people think it's futile, but um, if as we go through um, these shed, shed streets and make even temporary um, traffic changes to it, um, to me, the worst violator is Waze. Um, if we could just keep notifying them um, that there is, you know, limited local access, et cetera, um, because I kind of feel like if we keep doing it, I know there's a process, and some people say to me, well, yeah, but they really don't pay attention to it. But it's kind of like if you keep doing it each and every time, squeaky wheel, maybe um, they might actually incorporate that because um, I did speak to some neighbors down afterwards about the experiment and it was just their anecdotal history and, and sort of um, them surmising that the people who were uh, wanted the wider street for uh, to be able to travel, um, by and large, they weren't people who not only um, didn't live in the neighborhood, but didn't live in Arlington. And that was the identified shortcut um, to get through. So I know it may be um, some say you know, please don't really listen, but if we could just throw in that into the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Ancest, for the presentation. I'm excited about this project, as I mentioned before. As a father of two young kids that ride their bikes in the streets, I think this is a great way to uh, for kids to get out there safely and families to to social distance out on the Arlington streets. My only disappointment is that they didn't have anything up in my area of the heights but hopefully i can get some neighbors together to to make a recommendation um so just for clarity of the minutes i just want to confirm that we have motion by mr caro as revised and then we have an original second by mr diggins and mr diggins i'm just going to turn to you just to make sure that you 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 second mr caro's revised motion well actually mr DeCourcy did Okay. But I'll be happy to do it if that, you know, the, the, okay. yeah, Mr. Gorsi did. He seconded right. it, did revise Mr. Kuro. Right. So I, th I thought you were the original second on it. Okay. I, I was, but then Mr. Corsi did. But if you want me to, I'll be happy to. Hey, so, so I'll tell you what, why don't I just second it? Okay. Okay, there we go. All right. So we have a motion by Mr. Kuro, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Hyde? Ms. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. 
Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. All right. So that takes us to item number 12 on our discussion on the traffic, traffic rules and order, one which I'm very excited about. Endorsement and approval, Blue Bike Share Agreement and Blue Bike and Bike Share License. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before the board tonight is a request for two things. First is to endorse a bike share agreement with uh, Blue Bikes, otherwise known as Motivate Massachusetts, which is a subsidiary of Lyft, um, to enter essentially a contract for uh, Motivate or Lyft to service Blue Bikes expanding to Arlington. Uh, I'm gonna expand on that in just a second. And then the second piece is asking the board for a license uh, to run a bike share program on Arlington's uh, public and private ways. If I can take a step back for a second, uh, folks will obviously remember a previous pilot program that we uh, engaged in for dockless bike share. Um, the business model there, as well as the sort of vector to how we got a uh, bike share of the dockless variety in Arlington was a little bit different. In this particular case, um, in part uh, through a grant from MassDOT and in part through a, a donation um, from Metro Future, uh, a, um, a nonprofit, and as well as a $20,000 appropriation from town meeting, we are going to own this, uh, the components of the system. We will own the docks, we will own the bikes, we will essentially be contracting with Blue Bikes to uh, run this system for a period of, of roughly two years while this license is uh, at work. I wanna uh, focus uh, the, uh, I, wanna, I wanna take a moment to notice that the work uh, was primarily done by uh, Dan uh, Amstutz, who's still with us, who worked really tirelessly with a number of current non-member communities, planners, council, and the MAPC to try to uh, have this option be available uh, in Arlington. Uh, as my memo outlines, we're just again uh, sort of endorsing this contract which has to be executed by the town manager tonight if the board so chooses and grant uh, this license if the board so chooses. There's still a little bit of work to be done in terms of establishing where exactly the blue bike stations would go. Um, I think Dan could speak to that if you have questions about that, but he'd be looking to come back to you, I believe, at your August meeting with some suggestions as to where we would place those. And uh, I think the goal is for the system to launch sometime around Labor Day. A few other observations. Uh, whereas uh, most of the sort of regulatory aspects of this, of the previous dockless bike share system were in these sort of pilot regulations that were promulgated by the board. Here, most of the regulation of the blue bike system is uh, through the contract. And uh, it's a little bit complicated because the contract uh, is part of a wider system that needs to have interoperability. And uh, some of the rights, as I put in the memo, of, of folks who first built out the system are different than newer community members. There's sort of three main groups. There's sort of Boston who launched um, Hubway, which became Blue Bikes, and they have some uh, sponsorship um, and sort of legacy rights, if you will, uh, with respect to the system because they invested a tremendous amount of money in building the system. Then there's uh, communities that joined a little later. A little later, I believe Everett, uh, for example, was one of the more uh, recent uh, folks to join. And now there's a group of more suburban communities um, or metro area communities like Arlington, who is being offered an opportunity to join uh, at what's a pretty good financial deal but that does mean that there was also less um, leverage and sort of purchase uh, relative to negotiation of some of these terms. Um, there are a few things that are a little bit, um, I'm sorry, I couldn't provide a little bit more information on, including the um, sort of Blue Bikes Governance Council. Uh, but um, for the most part, uh, the again, the sort of agreement itself that the town manager would execute uh, contains most of the provisions about how blue bikes work in Arlington. You'll notice that there's a reference to Boston's contract. And the reason there's a reference to Boston's contract is um, 
in an effort to sort of simplify the contracts for new members and streamline them so that they um, essentially are compatible. Um, some of the specific things that the board's been concerned about and other communities have been concerned about, such as data, um, those things uh, were essentially uh, controlled by a reference to the Boston Agreement, which says we have the same rights with respect to uh, data privacy uh, and, and access to data as uh, Boston, uh, one of the founding members. I know that's a lot of information, but I just wanted to put that out there, uh, not only for the board, but for the public. And I know that Dan is with us, um, who can provide uh, even more uh, detail on both what still needs to be done and uh, certain aspects of, of the agreement. Thank you. Mr. Hurd, I think you're still muted. I gotta stop muting myself. Um, Dan, was there anything that you wanted to add to to Attorney Himes presentation before I turn to the board? Sure, I can just add, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the intention uh, with regards to the, um, the station siting, so we would receive, or we would begin with six stations. And um, in terms of siting those, I've worked with a few members from ABAC and um, from EELS to look at some of those locations and also in talking with blue bikes. Um, so we've created sort of a, a, uh, sort of three different possible sort of slates of, of st station locations to, uh, because the, the nearest stations to us are in Cambridge and Somerville, it logically progresses that we have to start in the East Arlington area. And so the uh, stations themselves have to be no more than a third of a mile apart. So it, it sort of leads to um, citing the stations we can get as far as Arlington Center, but it's um, progressively difficult to try to get further than that. So the idea is that if um, uh, if the board endorses this and, and we move forward that with the contract with Blue Bikes, that we would um, begin public engagement on those station sightings in the next few days and have that uh, you know, try to complete that within the next couple of weeks so that we can be very specific, uh, understand what um, you know the public thinks is, is very important in terms of which locations. Um, for example, Capitol Square is one that keeps coming up and it's in a very uh, good sort of geographic location for this. And so to see um, after we look at that, where would those stations go very specifically and detailed and understanding um, making sure we don't have utility conflicts or public works, you know, has um, work that they need to do um, in, in the near future and so on. And so communicating with public works and the police department on those specific, very specific locations. And that's what we would come back um, to you at the August meeting was to actually have those specific locations so that we can move forward with uh, installing them in the next weeks following that. Um, I do want to add also that uh, Dominic Trebone is in the in attendance here as a participant. He is, uh, I believe, the general manager of the. Uh, there he is. He's in the general excuse me general manager of the Blue Bike system, and so if you have any Blue Bike specific questions, you could also ask him. Thank you. And I will turn to Ms. Mahan for any questions, comments, or motions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to make a motion that we in, approve and endorse the Blue Bike Share Agreement and its affiliated bike share license. Um, and I understand that this will be coming back to us um, again in August, but if I could, through you, Mr. Chair, ask if um, Mr. Trebone or Dominic um, could, understanding um, the finalized license and agreement will come back in August, but um, if there's anything he feels comfortable adding to the discussion right now. Sure. Mr. Chaplain, can you promote Mr. Trebone? Trebone? He's, he's, uh, he's here, yep. Yep. I, I'll thank you um, for having me. Um, I have nothing particular to add. I think um, uh, Dan summarized it well. Um, but I'm just, you know, we're here to kind of work with you uh, to site stations and you know, we're excited at the prospect of Arlington and several other communities joining 
Blue Eggs Network um, and expanding it uh, this summer. All right, thank you. And we'll keep you as a, as a panelist in case we have any more questions from the board members. All right, I'll turn to Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll, I'll second uh, Ms., Ms., Mrs. Mahan's motion. Um, a couple of questions on the, the agreement, and, and one of the things that, that is mentioned is, is moving equipment in the event of a, of a winter storm. And I know in Boston, the docks come down, I don't know if it's December or, or late November, but what, what's the intention over the winter with the, um, the, the operation of the system? Um, I can answer that. The, um, since 2017, actually all stations that are on the sidewalk, basically not in the streets, stay up over winter. Um, and that is um, what we would intend to do with Arlington and any new community, um, is that street stations on the street generally st um, are removed for winter so that you all can plow, um, but stations that are on sidewalks or plazas um, stay down so that we have a bike share system in the winter. Um, I'll note that as we've been having increasingly warmer winters, our ridership has gone you know, up each winter um, to the point where we were seeing several thousand trips a day, even in February this year, um, before the entire pandemic happened. Okay, thank you. And, and one other question, just on the, the, the Boston agreement, I know right now their agreement runs through April, 2022. Have they already extended their term or is that an event that happens later? Because our period is tied into the termination of the Boston agreement. They have not. Um, there is a specific timeline in that contract when they begin that discussion, but it's in 2021. Okay, all right, thank you. And one question for Mr. Heim, um, if, I, if I could, Mr. Chair. Just having to do with advertising, and, and I understand that the Blue Bikes has a right to, to advertise on the stations and the sponsorships are on the bikes, but is there any issues, I guess it would depend where the station goes, whether there could be any conflicts with our sign by law? Sure, so my perspective on this is to be uh, safe. We should um, uh, make sure that there's an application under the uh, sign bylaw uh, of the zoning bylaw. Uh, whether or not it, uh, each one of these things would count as something covered by a sign law, I have to take a little bit of closer look at the stations themselves and what the uh, advertisements and promotions look like. There's sort of two pieces to it, as far as I understand it. I, uh, Mr. Uh, Charbon may correct me, uh, but uh, there's the sort of overall sponsorship that makes Hubway bikes, I shouldn't call them Hubway bikes, that makes the bikes blue bikes, the, the Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then there's the sort of secondary piece of it, which is the uh, docking stations themselves occasionally have, I, I've seen them at least, uh, some sort of advertising signage or promotional signage. Um, but I, I think that that type of thing could probably be uh, handled before uh, the zoning authority further proceeds. Okay, okay and, and just one comment, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I think it's great to be joining this system because it's it's in Cambridge, it's in Somerville, and it's in Boston, and it's it's just a it's a nice extension. That was one of the you call it a deficiency of, of the, the the last system we had, just be, because the, the network wasn't as expensive as Blue Bikes. I think it's a real exciting opportunity for bikers, and I know that there's a, a low income pricing model that Blue Bikes has as well, and I imagine that will apply um to, to users in town i think that's great as well yep all right mr diggins thank you mr chair and um and through you to mr travone good to see you dom and uh <laughs> so wow <laughs> so, so, yeah, i know dom from um you know the mbt from his days at mbta so he just small world huh you know uh anyways um um do you have a, what happens to after two years and um, so I just mentioned this agreement go for two, goes for two years. Then what happens after that in terms of the cost of the town? Mr. Chair, do you want me to answer that or do you want Mr. Travon to answer that? Um, Whomever. Attorney Haim, you can take a crack at it if you can. <laughs> so um, as Mr. DeCourcy sort of alluded to earlier, our, our contract is sort of overall tied to um, the other uh, Blue Bike communities. Um, there's a provision in the agreement that allows Blue Bike uh, sort of right of first refusal to buy back uh, the system if essentially 
there's not an extension of the license by Arlington, or there's not an extension of the program by the Blue Bike. Is that a fair summary from your perspective, Dominic? Yeah, um, and you know, I think the, the terms of the two years are partly, if I remember correctly, tied to the MassDOT grant. Um, there isn't, um, nothing totally defined happens at the end of two years. We intentionally left that open to negotiation with the, intent, the understanding that um, the town may like this and the town may not like this, and you all have the flexibility to have, make it another decision in, in two years. Um, assuming the Boston contract is extended. That is the one um, criterion that has to be met. Um, it doesn't exactly make sense to operate a dock bike share system in Arlington if there isn't one in Cambridge and Boston. Um, and uh, there is a threshold in the contract above which we are very willing to continue operating the system. The number um, escapes me at the moment, but we um, figured out what we think, you know, ridership revenue will exceed the cost of operating the system. And we think at that point, we should just continue operating the system, assuming the town assents to that. Gotcha. Okay. And, uh, and, and, um, so you're branching out. I mean, do we have a sense of, of how, um, many people, how much the systems used in compar comparable towns to Arlington? Um, you know, I might say that Arlington uh, has no peers. Um, uh, well, actually, is it, it, we, this is our first experiment sort of into um, a town like Arlington. Yeah. Uh, the Everett is a different model. Um, Everett's a very different place. Uh, right. It was driven by the casino um, going in. Right. Um, and that's the, the money that was used to pay for it. Um, so, you know, there isn't really an analogous town in the Boston area that I can think of. Um, yeah. yeah we're model. I, I, my guess is Arlington will perform, if I had to guess, Arlington will perform somewhat like parts of Brookline um, as an area that's close to other dense portions of the metro area, but slightly more residential, still with a nice commercial strip or two um, and sort of a very good bicycle network. Well, it'll be interesting to see how you make that, that, uh, that dirt mile jump me from the nearest location that I can think of, which is at the bike path in Cambridge to Arlington or from, from um, Alewife uh, to Arlington. But we'll leave that for uh, the, next, the next meeting and, and, um, and the placement of the racks. Um, so I, um, this is maybe a little a feel to me, but I suspect the exclusivity is just kind of general. And, uh, but um, I mean, it's just there. I mean, but I'm just trying to understand why it's there. And um, so, and I'll, I'll get at something I mean, a little bit after you answer that question as best you can. Yeah, I mean, the exclusivity um, is because this is a system where we are paying all of the operating costs and we are keeping the revenue. Um, and so that is the balance. You all own the equipment, um, uh, but you're not paying for any operations except for like, you know, there's some very specific circumstances um, where you will ask us to move a station um, or something like that. Um, but otherwise, you know, to keep the lights on um, effectively, we've got to make revenues cover costs and having exclusivity makes it much more likely that we do that. Uh, so that is how the blue bike system works. That's why Lime wasn't in Boston because the system in the Boston area um, owned by the towns as a public or the cities in that case as a public transportation system, um, you know, needs the exclusivity in order to um, effectively cover costs um, with the revenues that are coming in. So splitting that among multiple operators makes it just less likely that you're going to have a sustainable system that will stick around. I understand that, you know, and, and so, so I'm curious, so what are people competing? I mean, first off, are there competitors and then what are they competing on? You know? hmm. Sorry, I could go on if you cut off or I just. Sure. No, so, so who, who are the competitors I mean, and, and what are they competing on? Meaning is it that they offer a cheaper ride or they offer the uh, lower installation cost? Yeah. Well, and pricing is publicly controlled. So pricing is controlled by the governance council. So that is contractual. 
Um, so we don't have unilateral authority over pricing. Um, that is part of the public nature of the system. Um, so the governance council set, has set the price at um, 250 for a single ride, $99 for um, a regular annual pass, um, $50 for an income eligible pass. And all of these um, can only be changed um, either with approval of the council, or I think we're allowed to go up by inflation, although we haven't actually done that. Um, it gets you to weird numbers. Um, so that's part of the, the public nature um, is in exchange for exclusivity, we've given up some control of pricing. We've um, given you all a lot of control um, in some way or another over station siting, et cetera. Um, and we have many contractual obligations um, in order to you know, keep people's data safe, et cetera. Um, so that's one of the, the things, like if, in terms of who are the competitors, um, think of this in two ways. If you think of it, this is competition for the market in the way that say the MBTA competes the commuter rail contract every couple of years or 10 years, um, you know, you have other operators um, who will also operate docked bike share systems. Um, you'll have other operators who will provide equipment um, for uh, bike share systems. Um, and then you have other micro mobility companies that like operate as Lime and Oppo and you know, several others do. Um, but they don't operate in, under contracts to governments usually, they operate under permits or other agreements that allow them to just operate a private business. Um, and this, like that is not currently the model that Blue Bikes um, exists under. Blue Bikes exists under a model where it is a public service provided under public contract with um, pretty substantial amounts of public control. All right, thank you. Yeah, so that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to see you too, Len. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Mr. Carl. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Um, I know when we had looked at, um, as, as a board, and I think some of our members weren't on yet, we had looked at a number of different options and, and we were very, very, very interested in, I, I think it was still Hubway at that time, um, the uh, predecessor to Blue Bikes. Um, I loved the dock list, but it did have its, its issues. Um, um, so I'm, I'm so enthusiastic that, that, that we have this option available to us. And for those um, residents who are listening, you should recognize that um, part of what we're getting ready to endorse is an agreement which uh, comes along with a package of um, uh, grants as well, which um, once it's fully executed will have the town actually outlaying $20,000, um, but we will receive the benefit of $254,000 um, in infrastructure uh, for this. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good deal. I think that this is gonna be very important, especially as we're uh, emerging from the pandemic and some people are still afraid to get into buses, um, but, but you know, they'll be happy to take a, a shared bike down to, uh, to Alewife. And we, we see them on the we see them on the trail now even even though we're not part of the system um, I just had a couple of questions um, one of them has to do with the um, third of a mile spacing is that a third of a mile as the crow flies or is that a third of a mile um, travel distance is, is how, how is that requir requirement uh, interpreted it, it's um, just as the crow flies Third of a mile as the crow flies. Okay. That gives us a lot more uh, flexibility, I think. Yeah. Um, and is, is anyone in a position to uh, say what other communities are, are, are uh, looking at uh, joining into the network? Because it looks, looks like from the memo that there are a number of other communities that are looking to, uh, to join in as well. Um. I believe at least the grant application, uh, app, um, those who apply for the grant is public information. Um, does that sound right, um, Town Council? I could say that? Yes. Yeah, so the other communities that applied for the grant with you and all received it are Watertown, Newton, and Chelsea. Um, so those, those are the other three communities. Um, and so obviously, um, Watertown shares a border. Uh, no, it doesn't. It gets close, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> um, Got to go through Cambridge. <laughs> Cambridge and Belmont. Yeah. Um, but there, uh, that's that's nearby and uh, Newton as well. Okay. Okay. Great. 
Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about this. I look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. And as I mentioned before, I'm excited about this. I would, yep. Go ahead, Mr. Carroll. I'm sorry. One more sure. question. There, there was reference in, I think, in the Boston contract to public employees discounted rate. Does that, uh, does that carry over to our agreement as well, where we're referencing the Boston contract? I don't believe so. <laughs> I'm still enthusiastic, maybe not <laughs> quite as enthusiastic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, no problem. I still have you up on my screen, so I was able to see you. No, I, I'm excited about this. I was excited about the bike share system with our line bikes, but as I texted the town manager many times, every time I went to look for a line bike when I needed it, I couldn't find one. So I like the idea that this, you know, there'll always be bikes in a location where we know how to access them. So I think this is good for the town, good for our continued efforts to improve transportation and non-vehicular transportation at that. So I'm happy to support this. All right. I lost my notes. All right. I have a motion for approval by Ms. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Hahn? Ms. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Kiro? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. And thank you, Mr. Drabone, for all of your help tonight. Thank you. All right, moving on to item number 13, the agenda discussion of board designee committee assignments. So we did have posted with the agenda our current list of committee assignments. Obviously, Mr. Dunn is no longer with us and Mr. Diggins has joined us and is looking to serve. Of course, so, of course. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll, I'll open up to the board to see if there's any particular committees that they currently serve on that they want to give up. Otherwise I can go through Dan's committee assignments and just get someone to fill fill his positions because he does have a number of them um, to fill. So Mr. Carl, is there anything that you particularly want to put out there for another member or? Um, if I have any assignments that, that somebody's really interested in, I'm happy to to um, to um, consider it. But I'm not chomping at the bit to jump off of anything either. I'd, I'd only note that um, there are a couple here that jump out at me that, um, like the school enrollment task force, that doesn't really exist anymore. That's that's defunct. Um, and I also think that the um, where is it? The application and permit working group. Uh, that, for all intents and purposes, is is defunct as well. I, I'll, um, I was charged with making some some proposals around the handbook to come back to the, the board with, and and um, I'll I'll come back with some of the things that have been discussed a couple of years ago. That group that's basically defunct as well. But uh, beyond, beyond that, um, I'm not chomping at the bit to give anything up. But uh, but frankly, if somebody has a real burning interest, I'm happy to uh, accommodate. Okay, Ms. Mahan. Um, I think I'm on, with the ones that are still active, I think I'm on two. So I'd like to keep them. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Mr. Corson? Yeah, I, I'd like to keep what I'm on as well. The, the, the one that I, they've been on, probably spent the most time the past year, is long range planning. If, if there is another committee that I'm on and someone else feels very strongly about, getting on it, I'm, I'm happy to step aside, but the, the long range planning is, is one that I'd like to continue. Okay, so I do have everyone just about on my screen here. I think for this one, we can do a show of hands as, as I go down. So D, we have the tree committee that Dan was on. Is there anyone that want, wants to take over the tree committee? Oh, can I can I say um, something, Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Chair, that may help things? Yes. You know, 
I think Dan had like a great suite of um, so so I mean unless people really want them, I mean uh, uh, I'm happy with them, I mean, but but so so you yeah. can default to me, and then people just can grab what they want. But I can see the way that you're going, so yeah. so that since I'm the junior member, I mean I should just take whatever's left over, and I'll be happy to take whatever's left over. So so that's it. Thank you. All right, well, I'm awarding you the tree committee. I, I'm just gonna if there is a committee that multiple people want that somebody wants to jump onto that Dan was on. I'm just going to lay it out there in case we have two people that want to do so. All right. So marijuana study committee. Lend that to you. Thank you. All right. Snow and ice committee. Len, I'll give you that. Yeah, we'll ban snow and ice in town, all right? <laughs> and I know we, we've already had some email correspondence about having you replace Dan on the Rainbow Commission, and that's a great fit, so we're going to put you down on the Rainbow Commission. That would be fabulous. All right. So Dan is on long-range planning with Steve. Is there anyone that – so we have Diane – you're interested? All right, so I'm going to put Diane and Steve will be on long range planning. Information Technology Advisory Committee, which I think that is right up your alley. So, Mr. Diggins, I'll put you on that. Or Mr. Kuros. So, Mr. Kuros, would you be interested in that? If, if, you're, if, if you're not particularly interested i'm i'm happy to to uh step in but it um well i am interested but i don't want to i don't want to take all the all the the good ones i mean i think you really have a lot of expertise you know so so um a i'd be interested i mean if you want what, please take it you know i mean and and to the extent <laughs> that because I, mean, I, I think it's you, you haven't participated <laughs> take my committee please is, is it token I'll take I'll take it. Yeah, no, 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 it, it, it's consistent with my profession. Right, we don't want to overload you too. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then I can get insights from you so yeah. that maybe later on. Yeah, thanks. And I don't want to be greedy. All right. We have the investment policy working group. If I show of hands, anyone want to take that? Well, I, I could verify. I think the treasurer has come back with that policy or has done that work. Um, that might be one that doesn't need to meet anymore, but I could verify that. I, I believe that's correct, Mr. Uh, Chaplin. All right, so we will X that out as one of our defunct groups. If needed, we'll be at it. All right, and then the last one that Dan was on is the Clean Energy Future Committee. Diane? Yep. All right, yes, please, I mean. We'll put Diane on that. All right, so we'll have these updated and we'll circulate them. Um, so, everyone has their committee assignments. So, oh, Mr. Hurd? Yes. Uh, uh, so, with uh, respect to um, TAC, uh, so uh, I am a member of TAC still. Uh, I guess maybe we need to resolve that because uh, I'm a member as a, I'm representing an uh, ACMI as part of the um, Chamber of Commerce. It, uh, now I can continue in that role, be, or I can be a liaison from the select board. Me, but I am attending the meeting, so it's really up to you. you I'm know? happy to pass that over to you. As soon, well, just give it to Attorney Heim to confirm if one person can serve two roles or if there's one role that takes precedence over the other. Well, if there's two spots, mm. uh, he, he should not occupy, Mr. Digging should not occupy two spots. If he would like to be a, the board's representative, that would open up a right. spot for somebody else. Um, but you could, in theory, have Mr. Diggins uh, continue in that spot and appoint another board member. So it depends on the board's bandwidth. So then I think what you could do, if it's okay with you, is you could be the board representative on TAC. It's a voting position. And then 
you can, or is it, I don't know if it's voting position, but you can resign as the member, as the Chamber of Commerce representative, and they could fill that with another person. Yeah, so I was really just trying to verify what it is that you want to do and then just kind of clarify, you yeah. know, my, my role there. And, and so, so if, um, uh, I guess it'll be legit for me to continue maybe this conversation with Mr. Hurd. Uh, we've been violating open meeting laws. And, um, I mean, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I apologize. Sorry, go ahead. Mr. Chair, I would just say that, yeah, if, 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 if the board is inclined to just sort of let the discussion continue offline between you and Mr. Diggins about how you want to, how he wants to um, fill that, that seat. Uh, if you're okay. That's fine. Okay. Great. We'll work it out. All right. Thank you. All right. So we have our updated community assignments. I'll circulate these. We do not need a vote since it's my decision. So um, we'll close that. And that takes us to correspondence received. So we have correspondence related to the property at 1207 to 1212 Massachusetts Avenue from Don Seltzer of Irving Street. Correspondence requesting safety signage on the Minuteman bike path from Joshua Martin via the Request Answer Center. We have correspondence from of the appointment of an election officer for the retirement system S September 29th election from Richard Greco, election officer, retirement administrator, Arlington Retirement Board, and a letter regarding 339 Mass Ave LLC from attorney Robert Anessi. And so I so it's on the first one. We have a motion to receive or I I'd make a motion uh, move receipt of correspondence received. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All right. So attorney Heim. Ms. Bahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. All right, and that takes us to new business. Attorney Heim. I just wanna highlight again how uh, terrific Dan Amstutz was in pulling together um, a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions about um, the bike share matters. Uh, and I really appreciate all of his patience on this matter as, as, as we've had a lot of things uh, tugging at all of our attention and he's been coordinating with a lot of different folks. So I just wanna share he was uh, exercising wonderful leadership in that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chaplain? Yes, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, I didn't speak up fast enough. Uh, under correspondence received number 15, uh, the request regarding safety signage on the bike path. Um, I, I'll ask Dan Amstutz to look at that and work with Mr. Martin that wrote in that regard. I, I believe that APAC, uh, APAC, ABAC, and Dan had already put together some safety signage that they were thinking of proposing on the bike path that may cover this request. Um, but we will take a look at that and respond to Mr. Martin. I just wanted to um, state that on the board. Uh, a couple other uh, things I wanted to mention. One that uh, I just learned of while we were sitting here tonight and is uh, at least uh, related to uh, something that was mentioned during um, open forum. So the Winchester Select Board is also meeting right now, and they've been conducting their meetings with a Zoom, the Zoom meeting platform. And they were Zoom bombed, and some very graphic pornography was shown on the screen. That was very disturbing. Everybody participating, and the town manager uh, was referred to uh, by a racial, a racial slur, which uh, has obviously shook her up very bad. Though I know that there is concern and the system that we are using right here might not be perfect, uh, acts against issues like that uh, from occurring. I think it is humane to bring up that as, we, as we're sitting here having this discussion right next door in a neighboring town, a very disturbing event happened, uh, a Zoom bomb. So um, again, a discussion we can keep having, but 
um, I think we're, we, we might be limiting on one side, but we're protecting against uh, upsetting things happening um, by choosing another path. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to share that um, this week, I'm interviewing what I think is now nine applicants for the design review committee for the Mass Ave and Appleton intersection discussion. Uh, so we hopefully will be able to get that design review committee up and running very soon. A lot of applicants, a lot of talented and interested applicants, and um, almost as always, Arlington uh, doesn't surprise uh, or doesn't disappoint with how many interested, willing volunteers there are to serve and, and try to make it a better place. That's all I have for new business. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may on that. Yep. <clears throat> um, if you could just briefly, um, either the chair or the town manager, uh, refresh my memory because I'm going blank on it now. Um, but with regards to Charlie Proctor, and I know his memorial was going to go in concert with what's being designed out there. And it, am I correct that my memory was we didn't send that request or did we to public memorial or did we send it directly to who's overseeing the process the manager just spoke to? So my, my recollection is the board approved the placement of a memorial and I just now need to work with public works for the placement of the bike uh, somewhere appropriate in the intersection. Okay, because I, I was thinking, I don't remember doing that. I think we just went the direct route. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. On any new business? Um, <laughs> um, I, I have had conversations um, with the chair and um, with Mr. Chapdelaine uh, regarding um, when the town of Arlington's next regular town meeting would be. Um, I think from talking with Mr. Hurd, perhaps um, we might ask the moderator to come in um, when the chair deems appropriate um, to talk about that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to um, put out there for everyone just to start um, thinking about, and if, if the chair or the town manager is the person after it's determined when Mr. Leone, the moderator, should come in. Um, it seems Lexington was fortunate enough that they had a resident, and I want to say, I think I know the gentleman's name, but I don't want to misspeak, but I believe he's also a um, town meeting member. And from what I've read of the coverage of that on the Lexington list, this gentleman, Lexington resident, basically what they said was he created his own framework platform for Lexington's regular town meeting, which allowed, um, cause a lot of people say, why don't you just do a big zoom meeting? We, we can't just do that cause zoom does not have the features to when a town meeting member wants to raise their hand to speak as well as recording votes. And the way they accomplished it in Lexington is they were fortunate to have a resident like that. So one of the things I would say um, through the chair, and uh, when we do have this as an agenda item, um, do we want to maybe put that plea out along with um, our IT department that we have? Um, or is it something that when we have that meeting, the town manager might say, you know, through IT, we can accomplish 50%. This is the other thing we need. So, uh, but I'll leave it to you, Mr. Hurd, when that um, meeting with Mr. Leone should happen. Yep. And yeah, I'll cover that in, this, in my new oh. business. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, no and uh, Mr. Corsi? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and th th just a, this is maybe perhaps a question um, through new business, but we had received the um, notification from Mass Housing on the MIRAC uh, proposed development. And I believe the deadline for responding to that is on August 10th. And I'm just wondering if it if a request for further time can be done administratively through the town manager's office or through town council or if not if if maybe we need to meet before august 10th just to vote an extension on that attorney Heim. um so let me confirm this but i do think that if the chair were comfortable authorizing a request for an extension of time just to submit the board's comments i think that can be done if it can't be done, I will definitely let the board know to make sure that we have um, a meeting for that sole, for that limited purpose. Thank you, Mr. Corson. For, for Thank, you. Thank you. Any more new business, Mr. Corson? I don't know. That's all I have. Uh, Mr. Carroll? 
No, no business. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Excuse me. Just to clarify, so the clock has started tick ticking on the comment period and the deadline is August 10th. So my understanding is that so the clock starts ticking when we get a notification from uh, Mass Housing. Um, I, I want to take a look at that a little bit more closely, but in the event that we need additional time, I believe that it can be done through the chair, but if it, for whatever reason it can't, I'll make sure to let the board know with plenty of advance notice. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, uh, but right now, just operate as if the, the, the deadline is the 10th of August. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, so I was going to raise similar um, new businesses to um, uh, Ms. Mahan. Uh, you say that you're going to speak to that, uh, Mr. Hurd. And I was going to go so far as to maybe uh, beg the rest of you all to maybe have a meeting on August 3rd and, uh, to meet with the town moderator uh, to determine something because I'm a little bit concerned uh, about the amount of time that we have left to pull this all together uh, if we're going to do it uh, this, this fall. Uh, and I have spoken with some people, anyone but any of you all, because I don't want to violate, violate um, open meeting laws. And I, know, I know that we have the people in town uh, that can pull this off and people in town that have connections with people in Lexington so that we can, we can do this. We can do this. Thank you. So I can make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, so I mean, we, we got a few inquiries about what town meeting is going to look like in the fall. Since when we had pushed out some, a number of articles, we had told them they'd be taken up at a fall special town meeting. I had, there was a request to put on the agenda tonight. I thought that was, it was still a little early in the summer to determine what that would look like. So likely we'll put that in our, on our August agenda to invite the moderator in if he's able to do so and just have a discussion as to where we are as far as the virus and you know what our options are to put together a special town meeting as presented. Um, oh, Mr. Chair? Yep. Um, I, I apologize, I should have added this. Um, I'm wondering, and I'll leave it to you and, and the town manager to um, see if it's appropriate and I don't wanna waste anyone's time. If either we have um, our Health and Human Services uh, Director, Christine Bongiorno, either at the meeting or and or provide do uh, documentation submission from her from the board of health end. so i'll leave that for you all to figure out thank you yep no problem um and then one another piece of new business that was just alluded to at the at one point in the meeting is that we had a couple of requests and i think we're all copied on this to rename citizens open forum due to the fact that we don't require citizenship um so we will likely post it with a different name, whether it will be Residence Resident Open Forum or another name that will be posted differently on our next agenda. And, and um, I, I just want to add to that when the board back first established so this is an open forum, the reason, because um, I know there was a suggestion of residents, the reason they didn't do that is some of the people who appear before us are not Arlington residents. They're Arlington business owners and sometimes they're like with uh, the case of Charlie Proctor, uh, as well as um, Daniel Rossetti, the people appearing before us. It wasn't a matter of using citizen, because you could say the same thing for resident. Sure. Um, so, yeah. so, but open we'll have forum. further discussion. We'll have a different name. I open don't. Open forum. <laughs> I, I, I am leaning towards open forum. But just I wanted to put it's, that. Your, it's your agenda, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. And then the last thing I just want to, you know, at this point, we're months into the crisis and we do, we've had, you know, a number of, we've had our first responders, we've had our town workers and just town residents that are healthcare workers and essential workers that have really carried the town through. And, you know, at the beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic, we acknowledge them often and, you know, I just don't want that to fade away. So I'd like to, I think I can just work with the town manager on this, but at the next August meeting, kind of brainstorm some way to acknowledge the work of the AFD, the, the APD, our Board of Health, our town staff, and 
you know, all of the medical professionals that have been working hard to get our town through this ordeal, and as well as all the essential workers, that the all-encompassing essential workers, and just have some way for us to commemorate those, because we have seen, I have seen those in other towns, and I think it'd be appropriate to do so at this point. So I can work with the town manager to put something together to present to the next meeting. And that is all the new business I have. Move to adjourn. Seconds. That's great. On a motion to adjourn by Ms. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Curl, Attorney Hahn. Ms. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curl. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. News. Well, it's not 1130, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there.